It's that time of the week. Yes, this week's Cult Movie Show, your weekly look at cult movies. Please welcome your hosts, Warren and Velvet. Yes, it is that time of the week again. (laughs) Welcome to Podcast 29 of the Cult Movie Show with myself, Warren, and sitting next to me virtually as always is the magnificent, gorgeous, funny, witty, the world dies when she walks into a room, Velvet Rose. <laughs> okay, are we introducing me or are we talking about the weather woman? Because now I just imagine a row of people lined up with roses in their teeth and now I'm going to do you know athletic flips down the red carpet all the way to my apartment. I but no, see- thanks, thanks for the lovely introduction. Hello, everybody. And yeah, as always, we're going to review some fucking movies tonight. And I say fucking movies because, wow, you know what? We got a little bit of everything tonight. <laughs> We've got... Ooh, we got some sci-fi, but this is out there, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on this one. We've got a musical, and we've got a really absolute cult classic that I cannot wait to fucking oh, talk about tonight. We've got yeah, some And we got notes. a really cool mini-movie that literally is a mini-movie. It runs, this is the longest mini-movie we've reviewed thus far. And, and I was like, wow, this one's actually a little longer than what we usually review, but we'll get to it. We will. And uh, just before we start, uh, just to all our listeners from Melbourne, uh, everyone knows that I am a Melbourne boy. Um, uh, just stay strong. Shit happens. We'll get over it. The sun is shining today. Don't need to say well, anything more. Well said. Well okay. said. Okay. So, um... We're not here to talk about horrific events. We're here to talk about um, some movies. So let's get started, I think, shall we, uh, shall we, Velvet? And uh, yeah. this, this one from the 1960s, if you grew up with, with me, you would know my love of a gentleman called Jerry Anderson. And so we're going to start uh, this podcast with the movie... Journey to the Far Side of the Sun, or as it's also known, Double Genya. Uh, you can, you know, pick and choose whatever you like. It runs under both titles. Now, it's from 1969, um, directed by Robert Parrish, and of course, created and written by uh, Jerry and Sylvia Anderson. Uh, and uh, this is a movie that I first saw as a very young child and have just have fallen in love with. It's one of my cult classics that I just absolutely, absolutely adore. Um, what I was going to say, I was just about, about to say, Velvet, what are your thoughts? But should we actually explain what the movie's about first? Or Yeah, no, go ahead and do the synopsis. Yeah, definitely do the synopsis. Okay, so it is set in 2069 in Europe. And, uh, and uh, in fact, the film was all filmed in Portugal. Uh, now, it stars uh, Herbert Lom, who I think most of you will remember if you're fans of the original Pink Panther uh, series of movies with um, uh, Peter Sellers, Herbert Lom, of course, played uh, Inspector... Sorry, uh, Chief of Police Dreyfus. Uh, so I think you'll all remember him when you see him. Now, the story is about uh, a space agency, Eurosec, which is meant to be basically the Euro- European Space Agency is what we call it today. And they launch a mission called the Sun Probe. And this Sun Probe discovers that there is a planet on the other side of the sun in identical orbit to Earth. Uh, and it has never actually been discovered before because we've never been able to see it before. So it's decided that we must actually launch a manned mission uh, to this planet to find out, you know, what it's all about and all the rest of it. Well, everything goes pretty well uh, until 
yeah, their landing on the planet isn't very successful. And then suddenly, <laughs> shall we just say, um, well, should I, I think it's okay to actually say what happens, Velvet. Yeah, is this it, movie's from 1969, so it's okay if we have some slight spoilers. Yes. So, <laughs> so w- when they land on the planet, um, uh, they find that uh, they're back on Earth. And they can't understand. How can they be back on birth? They flew to this other planet. They can't work it out. And also, oh at, at the same time, Eurosec and, uh, of course, um, uh, Herbert Lom is basically saying, why did you turn around? Because everybody believes that they turned the mission around halfway and came back to Earth. But then we start to learn that everything on this planet is in reverse Everything that's left <laughs> is right. Um, you can't read things properly. Everything is in reverse. And, of course, it is soon found out that, of course, this is a double ganger planet, hence the name. <laughs> it's identical to Earth, but everything is in reverse. And it then leads to, I won't obviously say how it ends. Um, oh, but God. <laughs> they, obviously, Sorry. they then try to reverse the mission to get back to their respective Earths, Um But here's a little problem. They can reverse engineer everything. They can make everything that's right, left, you know, and all the rest of it. But what about electricity? Do do you have to reverse the polarity? Or in a double ganger world, does electricity flow the same way? And this will be their undoing, is all I will say. Um, So, yeah, look, that's a a basic rundown. Um, Oh, See, I'm I, out of breath. I love the way I love the way you always do the little synopsis or you know the summary of the movie because you always make the movie sound good. And my very first initial impression of this movie within the first five minutes was, "Oh, this is a bad movie." <laughs> and then I honest, I I struggled through this entire movie. I was I, I was so bored. I was just oh, dying. My I could not wait for this movie to end. The the pacing for me was just. Literally, it was boring as shit. I even have written in my notes, lingering shots, boring as shit. I, I, could, I just, I, wow, this was horrible for me oh, as my a viewing goodness. experience. But you know what I do like this movie as? For me, this is one of those movies that I, I like the story, but just like I said, the pacing, the way the camera angles in this movie was constantly, zo- like in the beginning of the movie anyways, it was constantly zoomed in on people's faces and zoomed in on objects, like just super fucking close. And I'm like, okay, I get it. And then like just these lingering shots that would go too long. They paid too much attention to detail to all the wrong things. Like just like, you know, 10 second, almost 20 second camera shots of one single item. And I'm just like, okay, really, this is, you've been here too long. Keep moving, keep the story going. You know, I'm, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't take it. But what I do like is there is a lot of really visually interesting things in there. This has definitely got a little bit of that psychedelic influence. Oh, <laughs> we, yes. Yeah, you see some of that in there. So that's always fun to see. Um, I did watch this sober. So like I said, I was able to enjoy it sober. You know, I wasn't drinking anything or doing anything illegal. I never do. I promise. Yeah, oh, cool. But um, <laughs> but, uh, but this makes me think of when I've gone to parties or even like some bars that have just like you have a clean white wall and it's a dark club and they just have the projector set up and like this one uh, club slash bar I used to go to would just show like weird like art house sci-fi movies with really crazy imagery. This movie kind of falls into that realm. It's not so out there because there's a lot of, you know, people talking and explaining the science and theory and stuff. But then there's a lot of interesting, like, futuristic visual stuff or futuristic for the for 1969 in film. And I'm like, that's what I could see this movie being. Just like a nice background movie on the wall while I'm throwing a party, you know? Just like, don't have the sound going because, oh, the dialogue is so boring <laughs> i just yeah i i had high hopes for this you know it's one of those movies never seen never heard of it went into it doing no research and just whoo yeah it's 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 amazing i came out alive at the end because i was dying of boredom i just well, could not wait for this to end it, it, it's it's really interesting because this um this movie was of course jerry anderson's very first attempt uh, at using real actors, uh, because of course everything that he'd ever done before was with marionettes. 
Um, I think, you know, everyone remembers, um, you know, the Thunderbirds. And then we can go back to, you know, um, Fireball, Let's Sell 5, Stingray, and all the children's shows, you know, that a lot of people grew up with, even people now are still growing up with, um, you know, in repeat after repeat after repeat. And he is, in many ways, um, a children's TV icon, uh, you know, Jerry Anderson, for creating mm-hmm. that stuff. But this was mm-hmm. his very first attempt at using real people. So, you know, I suppose you got to give him a bit of a break. You know, it was his first real movie, um, mm-hmm. you know, in, in that sense. Um, wh- what is interesting, too, remember, too, that he'd just come out of doing um, Captain Scarlet. And then, of course, this was the next project where he decided that he wanted to actually make a movie for adults rather than a TV show for kids. Uh, but the problem with this was... <laughs> the, the censor board knew in Britain knew all too well that kids would be flooding to go and see this movie. Because, of course, you know, um, they grew up with Thunderbirds and all the rest of it, right? <laughs> so they're going to be. So the problem was that this movie was going to be extremely adult. And they actually had to cut this movie very, very seriously um, before it got its release uh, because they knew kids were going to watch it. Um, for instance, just to give you some examples. Um, yeah, no, no, I mean, you can definitely see that. I'm evidently way too immature for this movie because I was bored as hell. But, um, yeah, I, I, you know, if he'd thrown in some puppets for me, I think I would have been good to go. Yes, no, that would have been I'm, good. No, all joking aside. Um, I No, I do like the actual story. I mean, the story was cool. It was an interesting concept because it was basically, um, you know, parallel universe theory that, you know, that's what i got out of it was that you go up and then you come back to a different world and like you said it's the same but reverse i mean it was kind of parallel parallel universe theory which i thought was actually pretty interesting but uh i just uh uh, yeah there was no comic relief which you know like i said he wanted it to be serious he succeeded because yeah there was no comic relief so there was nothing to really bring up break up the monotony um there's some weird stuff in here. I mean, well, like I said, the, not the psychedelic stuff, but like I thought it was strange the that they were focused on the rest restaurants. I can't believe I just said restaurant astronauts. Restaurants. Wow. Astronauts. I must yes. be I must be hungry. <laughs> it was weird that they focused on the astronaut's relationship with his wife. Because honestly, what I thought was because he has this shitty relationship with his wife and th- then he comes, go- goes out into space, comes back. Everything's backwards for half a second. I thought it was going to be that now he has a great relationship. With his <laughs> wife. <laughs> but so no. I, I, was, I was being too creative, evidently. No, it wasn't that kind of reverse. It didn't reverse people's uh, personalities or, you know, intelligence That's or right. emotions. Or anything, yeah. But I thought it was strange that they did focus on that one astronaut's relationship with his wife. Because long story short, she was accusing him of being sterile because of radiation from going up into space, and then he was kind of like, "Well, no, maybe it's because you're on birth control." And so she's been lying about taking birth control, and that's why they can't have babies. And then he slaps the shit out of her. So I'm like, "Oh, nice, we got domestic abuse in this movie." So I was just like, "That was weird," <laughs> and that came out of nowhere. That was kind of pointless to the plot of the movie. Well, this was, you know, and well, see, this was all part of Jerry Anderson trying to make the story more adult. Um, so, oh, okay. So, for instance, uh, you know, um, there is a scene where there is actually a packet of, of uh, contraceptive pills on the mm-hmm. o- on the um, o- on the table uh, so mm-hmm. they're dealing with very uh, um, adult subjects so at least what yes. Gary Anderson thought were going to be adult subjects and this was yeah. a problem for the censors because mm-hmm. um, you know well the problem is that you know you, you've got kids who are eight years old who are in love with the Thunderbirds and they're going <laughs> to sneak in and see this film no matter how you rate it. You know, so we've got to give it a a much higher rating. Um, So Mm -hmm. what they then did, for instance, um, there's stuff which is not in this film but was originally filmed. Um, For instance, the Mm -hmm. wife is played by Lynn Long. Now, she Mm -hmm. um, uh, was actually the second choice because the original actress who was going to play the role fell ill um, just as they Mm -hmm. started shooting. But she actually did a several nude scenes in this movie. Um, oh, and wow. They were all because Jerry Anderson believed that realistically to prove what he was trying to do, he needed some nudity in the movie. Mm. And um, But they all, it was all cut out uh, because mm-hmm. they said, look, we can't have kids who have grown up on the Thunderbirds going to see naked women. 
you just you can't <laughs> do this. So, um, you know, so it was it was all cut out. Um, the other thing too is that you know how you said a lot of the shots take a very long time. You know, they yes. and so forth. And I think one of the reasons for this is the model making because Jerry Anderson and his team were famous for their models. And of course, you won't be let down by the model making in this movie. The rockets, the spaceships, the cities. They're all mm-hmm. built. They're all models, you know, all models mm-hmm. that are created. And his team mm-hmm. was so good at the time uh, that, in fact, when, um, you know, 2001 A Space Odyssey uh, was built, oh, sorry, was made, um, Hollywood actually tried to uh, steal a number of, well, not steal, but they actually offered to hire um basically his entire creative and production team uh, because they knew how good his model making skills were. And he actually Mm -hmm. turned them down because he knew he'd never get them back. (laughs) <laughs> that's so, a good point. Good yeah, point. so that's that's a, a really interesting story. Thank you to Andrew actually who uh, who found that out. Um, so um, it's yeah, but I think that's the reason why the shots are so long because they spent so much time and effort on these models that they keep filming it. You know, and remember too that they're filming this almost in a style like the Thunderbirds, and you've you've mm-hmm. sort of got to put that you know, keep that in in your mind sort of thing. But um, the amazing thing, though, is that even though this was not meant to be a movie for children, um, I first <laughs> saw this when I think I was about seven years old on children's <laughs> TV at about 8 o'clock in the morning. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't have been able to watch it, to be honest. I mean, I was, <laughs> I was barely able to watch it as an adult because I was, it just did not hold my interest. So, uh, but I think that just speaks to your intelligence, Warren, that if you were able to watch this as a child and you held on to it all these years and you love it as, you know, the cult classic that, that it is, I think you're just a highly intelligent individual. <laughs> well, thank <laughs> I, you. I, uh, um, I don't think I would have even been able to, like, I mean, also, like, the whole parallel universe theory. And, I mean, like, I wouldn't have been able to grasp any of these concepts as a kid. I just would have been like, man in a spaceship, go boom. You know, like, <laughs> just, I don't think I would have got much out of this as a kid well, at all. <laughs> were, you, were, you, were you ever a fan of, uh, of any of Jerry Anderson's work, um, Velvet? Of what kind? I'm oh, sorry, of Jerry Anderson's work, you know, Thunderbirds. I'm and- honestly not. Fa- I'm honestly not familiar with it. I'm honestly not familiar with it. Because that's the thing. I think that if you're a fan of, mm-hmm. you know, shows like the Thunderbirds, um, uh, what's another classic of his? Um, Space 1999. Um, yeah, see, I'm not familiar with any of those. Yeah. So, so. It, so, you know, Fireball itself, Five, Stingray, Captain Scarlet. There are so many uh, of these kid shows. Um, yeah, I'm and- not familiar with any of those. I think it just also could be just to do to where I was living as a child. And, you know, television's very regional in the 80s when I was a child. So, like, a lot of stuff that, like, the town next to you has totally different programming from what you have so it wasn't unusual for you to go to school and kids be like oh do you watch this show and it's like no they don't show it on my stations like you know this you know (laughs) before the magic of the internet and all the fun stuff we have now so i mean it really could just be i was in one of those areas that just wasn't showing that because i'm not familiar with any of those (laughs) and and i and i think and i think that's the thing if you had have grown up seeing those Mm -hmm. shows I think mm-hmm. you have a very different appreciation for this movie. But when you when you come mm-hmm. into like as I would say to anyone, if you've never seen any of any of Jerry and Sylvia Anderson's work, um, you'll come into this and you will sort of say, gee, this is so slow. And, you, 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 you know, you, you might actually sort of say, oh, well, the model making is amazing. But you'll say, mm-hmm. but that's not enough to save the film. And, and I understand that. You know, I, I totally right, understand right. that. But if you've come mm-hmm. from a history of growing up with Jerry Anderson as one of your child heroes, then it, you, you'll then this movie, you know, you'll love. And I and mm-hmm. I would say to a lot of other people too that if you have, if you're younger and you're let's say you've seen Thunderbirds, you know, on the TV maybe because I think he plays on the Sci-Fi Channel and you know some of Jerry Anderson stuff has played there. Um, you know, if you um I know that Space nineteen ninety nine was popular in the US. So if you, you know, have watched Space nineteen ninety nine and you haven't heard of this movie, then give it a try. Um so yeah, I mean I think that's fair enough. It's not gonna be a movie for everyone though. 
No, it's definitely not a movie for everyone at all. So I definitely wouldn't recommend it to everyone. Um, there are some things, like I said, I did like some of the stuff in, like like you said, the model making in it's really good. I like the science theory. I like the whole parallel universe theory. I love the um, 60s go-go fashion. I mean, very oh, nice. Oh, yes. Capsule. Yeah, I mean, that's really fun stuff, seeing the girls in the mini skirts that are supposed to be scientists, you know, stuff like that. Well, it, it was. It's That's very fun. Yeah, yeah. It, it was very interesting because all the costuming uh, was, was always done by Sylvia Anderson, Jerry's wife at the time. And okay. um, but and so you will find that of course everything that Jerry Anderson ever did was always set in the future. Nothing was ever set. You know, in modern times. So that's why, you know, this movie may be set in 2069, but it looks like 1969. <laughs> um, you know, it, it is, it, it is amazing how almost everything that the Andersons sort of produced would look like the swinging 60s. Um, it would, you know, it wouldn't really be until, um, the product that would be produced later, such as, um, Space 1999, the Terror Hawks, um, uh, uh, what was it? Uh, Space Cops, or I think it was called Terrible Series, but, um, that, that, that you know, that that would change. But from this period, um, Sylvia had so much influence on the fashion that basically every woman wore a mini skirt. It was, you know, it was just, that was what it was like, you know, so, uh, <laughs> uh, it's all fun. I like that. I like the, um, some of the technology that they had in this movie, like, you know, the invented technology that sci-fi films always have. Like in the very beginning, you have a man popping his eyeball out because it's actually a camera. Right? Yes. And I guess he, and was he stealing information? Is that what was going on? Yes. I actually got a little lost. Yeah, I he's... honestly got a little lost sometimes. Okay, so he was stealing information, and that's how he found out about, oh, there's a planet behind the sun. Is that what it was? Uh, <laughs> no, it's, well, it's still, it still works on the, um, the premise of East and West, um, you know, okay. like the goodies and the baddies sort of thing. So, okay. so okay. the idea that Europe and, or Western Europe and America are sort of aligned, but they're in different blocks. So you've got like the evil empire behind the the wall and then you've got like western europe who are modern and free and then they're friends with america who is modern and free so you've got these okay almost like george orwell's you know different uh worlds and okay. uh, so, but the idea is that the the europeans are doing stuff by themselves Sometimes with the help of the Americans, sometimes without. And the Americans are doing mm -hmm. their own stuff. Yeah, you get the mm -hmm. idea. So the uh, idea mm -hmm. was that the Europeans need American money. Uh, and there's a spy within the European Space Agency. And so they know that this spy will give the information to the evil people. And so it's their way of almost blackmailing the Americans to help fund the mission. Okay. Somebody got murdered in this movie. I didn't, I, I got lost. I was like, who got killed? Why did they get killed? What uh, happened? Well, this is, this is all the spy <laughs> stuff at the start. So, um, yeah, so it, it starts almost as a bit of a spy movie and then turns into a science fiction space movie. So um, it is a bit, you, you've got quite a lot going on here. The, the, the definitely, you've got quite a lot going on here. I mean, I remember as a kid, all I remembered was the rockets and the spaceships and stuff. I didn't really remember <laughs> anything else, <laughs> you know. Um, but interestingly enough, too, is that if you are a fan of Jerry Anderson, um, as I said, and you watched one of my favourite TV shows of all time called UFO, um, now you will find that much of the stock footage from this movie is reused in the TV show UFO. Oh, really? Yeah. So there's <laughs> okay. there's just a little bit of, you know, something for you. The cars were all reused. Much of the fashion was reused. Um, the uh, A lot of the models were reused. Even some of the um, just, you know, uh, shots, like, for instance, the rockets launching and all this sort of stuff, that would all be reused in the TV show UFO. That's cool. See, that's uh, a <laughs> that's maximizing your dollar. No, it's nice when I mean it's good that he didn't sign his deal with Hollywood because then he wouldn't be able to have use of those for other shows. So it's nice that he was actually able to reuse some of his footage and you know um, uh, props that he created for this movie. Oh um, yeah, I'll, it's it. it I'll, I mean, it's it's. I was just going to quickly say, and then sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> oh, no, you're uh, fine. No, the, you're fine. Um, is that um, uh, most Jerry Anderson, if you want to call it purists, will sort of say that where Jerry Anderson's work started to become 
far less popular was when he basically made deals with the Americans and started filming mm. American style programs. And they were never as successful. They were never very good. They were all basically mm-hmm. done on the concepts of money first, story and sets and models second. Um, and that's just not what the way Jerry was, you know, Jerry created these amazing models, um, you mm-hmm. know, and, uh, yeah, unfortunately, it's often been said that after Space 1999, Jerry Anderson's work was never as popular, basically, when the American influence came in. So, I was looking at some of the trivia on this movie, and they actually have some interesting trivia. So, one of the actors that, you can correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not 100% sure on the actor's name and the characters in the movies, because I just, I just honestly didn't grab that information while I was watching it. <laughs> right. but I believe, I mean, I just didn't pick up on it. I was trying to. Um, I believe believe one of the actors that played one of the astronauts, Patrick Weimark, was complaining of having heart trouble in the movie. And then later that year, the actor that played him actually died in real life from a bad heart. Wow. Now, I didn't know that, actually. I yeah, didn't know that. I was like, oh, wow, that's that's pretty intense. You know, there's your, you know, life imitating art. Um, yes. this, I, this, is, this is funny, but it's not. But I couldn't help it. I had to chuckle because it says here that Jerry Anderson – also said in interviews that he had to shoot all the important stuff for this movie with the two actors playing the astronauts, Patrick Weimark and Ian Hendry, because they were known for being heavy drinkers. And <laughs> they, they would, yeah, he, he said they would, uh, they would, you know, go for liquid lunches and they would just, they would by afternoon, they'd be plastered. So he had to shoot all their scenes in the morning before they get got drunk every day. <laughs> oh, it's a- <laughs> Which kind of cracks me up because their characters in the movie are very dry, very serious. So yes. You, you forget that they're actually acting that you know off camera they're obviously very irre- irresponsible drunks and i was like wow they uh they uh, pulled it off good in this movie because you never would have thought that <laughs> no 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 it's it's um it, it, oh, it's amazing when you find out all the behind the scenes gossip isn't it you know <laughs> totally and i'm yeah. not saying that to put anybody in a bad light but i'm like you know but I think it's funny that that just shows somebody's ability because we hear about this all the time, how actors have, you know, emotional problems, mental problems, drug problems, but they pull their shit together, do their scenes and movies, win awards. And then everybody's talking behind the scenes like, God damn, do you remember how he was drunk during that scene and he won an award like uh, Gary yeah. Oldman and uh, Gary Oldman, when he played Dracula, was known for actually being drunk during some of his performances in that movie. And they've made it to the final cut. <laughs> and those are drunk oh. performances, but you would never know it. <laughs> oh, well, it, it's uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, there. I mean, the, the, the movie Mad Dog Morgan, uh, mm-hmm. where the star of that was um Oh my goodness! I've forgotten his name now. Um, oh, don't you hate it when that happens? Um, yeah, I'll look it up for you. Uh, Matt I don't Morgan, but, um, but but anyway, <laughs> he literally played his entire role. Oh, Dennis Hopper. Dennis, Dennis Hopper. Hopper. He played oh, his yeah. entire role drunk and stoned. He was never sober for every he was scene like that of the in film. A lot of movies, from what I've heard, and I love Dennis Hopper. Rest his soul, because he was yeah, he was a fine actor, and he was I, known for yeah, boozing it up and just being on LSD and fucking movies and just working. And that's the stuff in the final print, and it's not bad. They're good performances, but you know, it's like wow. Oh well, there's, <laughs> well, there's, there's a scene in Mad Dog Morgan where uh, Mad Dog Morgan so, it, dies, right? And so he's meant to die, and then the actor. <laughs> over him sort of says he's dead and then you can see dennis hopper's there is like, uh, 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 hang on he's moaning <laughs> what and, and like and, uh, and, and, you know and then say and they say cut and they say dennis you're meant to be dead and he goes oh no i, I don't work like that man no no i don't work yeah. like that you've Oh God! Yeah. He couldn't accept that he died in the movie. No, well, apparently one of the one of the Aboriginal actors actually during when they made that film actually he disappeared from set and went walkabout. Okay, now uh-huh. now uh-huh. for for non Australians, if you don't know what walkabout means, it's when somebody leaves their life and just goes away to find spirituality and find their soul. <laughs> with, okay, right? That's what walkabout means. It's, it's a thing which is – it's a very important part of Aboriginal religion, okay? Right. But, it's a, but it's a term now used by every Australian. If you want to escape and rethink, you would say, oh, I'm, I'm 
Don Walkabout <laughs> sort of thing, right? So, <laughs> so anyway, so one of the Aboriginal actors on it, he, he vanished for like about four days and they didn't know where he was, right? <laughs> oh, dang. And he vanished. During the movie? And it, and it, yeah, just during the filming, right? So then he came back and they said, where have you been? He said, oh, I had to go walk about. He said, I had to go and speak to the elders and the spirits because oh, I'm God. scared that Dennis Hopper is going to die. <laughs> Oh, my goodness gracious. Well, yeah. He had good intentions. He had good intentions. Oh, it's just, oh, my goodness, just, yeah. But yeah if you watched this movie, uh, Journey to the Far Side of the Sun or Doppelganger, you would never know that the two main actors that play the astronauts are having liquid lunches and they're plastered every day by noon. Oh, no, <laughs> not, cause not they at all. play such dry, serious characters in oh, this movie. Absolutely. <laughs> and, and, and the other thing, too, is that this is, but I have to go back to your original point, actually, um, Velvet, and that is that there is no humour, comic one lines, just Mm-mm. any relief in this movie at all. Mm-mm. It is deadpan serious for the entire hour and a half. Right. Um, right. And that is a little bit difficult. I mean, I, I you wouldn't really see any humour, I was really think, in a Jerry Anderson production Probably until Terror Hawks, I think, uh, where Windsor, the character played by the robot played by Windsor Davies, uh, would often be quite humorous. Um, but it, it's, yeah, not really well known for comedy, put it that way. Mm-hmm. You know, and okay. I think, and I think this movie in some ways did just need a little bit of uplifting it was just a bit too heavy a bit too serious yeah because i mean in the beginning of the movie there's actual scenes that have absolutely no music and even that's like oh my goodness i'm like come on at least a little bit of music but then they like make up for it later but it's just like in the beginning it's like very slow pacing really zoomed in shots sometimes would be no music for a couple seconds and i'm just like oh man this this pacing's killing me <laughs> yes. like, is the whole movie going to be like this and the answer but, uh, is yes it is yes, all going to be like this it's going to be it's <laughs> Extraordinarily <laughs> slow. <laughs> oh, but- uh, back to the technology again. I did like some of the stuff they did. They had like, um, if you had heart problems, there was a bracelet you could wear, and if you were starting like getting close to having like, I guess you're constantly on the verge of having a heart attack, he'd let you know, and like the guy could take his medication and fix his heart before it was too late. And then they had like astronauts to make this journey to this, uh, you know, undiscovered planet. They had to sleep for three weeks on their ship, so they had like these, um, like these metal things implanted in their arms, so that when they got on the ship, they could hook it up to these tubes that would put them in, you know, basically to sleep for three weeks and wake them up. And <laughs> I was just like, that's pretty cool, uh, you know, invented technology for this movie. I actually really liked that. Oh yeah, he, I mean, look, he was a master of that. He loved, mm-hmm. um, you know, all of that little detail, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, but the other different thing too about this one is that the sets, of course, in this are all real life. Where before mm-hmm. he was making everything basically at what one is to six scale or whatever, you know, for Thunderbirds mm-hmm. and so forth. So, um, so the model making in this became obviously very different. Um, it's uh, it, it's. It, oh, but did you like the car in it, though? What did you think of the, the- <laughs> I thought the car looked cheap. I thought it looked funny, to be honest. I was like, I know it was supposed to look futuristic, but it just looked funny and cheap to me when I saw it. <laughs> but I did like that uh, the power reactor for the spacecraft, the Phoenix. Phoenix spacecraft's power reactor was uh, mag- manufactured by Rolls Royce. It had a little uh, yes. Rolls Royce logo on it. I know, I know. You've got to love that, don't you? It's it's like the the idea in 1969 that you know Britain would be one of the leaders in manufacturing in aeronautics and you know and, and space travel and all the rest of it. And uh, that didn't really quite happen, did it? <laughs> <laughs> like, I guess now if they were to remake this movie, they would have to replace uh, Rolls Royce with Tesla from uh, yes. not Tesla as Nikolai Tesla, but the, you know, the Tesla vehicles, because that's always cutting edge technology there. It's so, yeah. um, oh, actually, that'd be that'd be quite interesting, actually, to do something like that. If you did remake yeah. it and you were mm-hmm. going to brand it. Yes. Instead of Rolls Royce, you could brand it. Um, although be, you'd have to change it all. Obviously, Tesla's an American company, but um, you know, <laughs> but, but but to brand it Tesla would actually be kind of cool. I actually, think. yeah, it would be you actually because uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I don't really know if this movie could be remade. I think no, it's um definitely no. This is it needs to be left alone. It is what it is. It's a you know 1969 cult film. It's definitely a time capsule. It's like the fashion. Um, 
even like the whole spy motif. I mean, like we still have spy films today, but I feel like that was definitely more prevalent around that era to have the whole spy theme, spy versus spy. You know, we want to get to to this new planet before the other places do. Because they were talking about that in the film too. They're like, oh, we got to get to this planet first before somebody else does. Oh and, yes, there's still a space race concept yeah, is still yeah, in this. Yeah, yeah. exactly, exactly. Um, but uh, but but the interesting thing though, we talked about remaking is of course that. Two Jerry Anderson series have been remade. Um, first was mm-hmm. Captain Scarlet, was made totally in CGI. Um, mm-hmm. And then, of course, Thunderbirds has only recently been remade, uh, but in Britain. Um, uh-huh. But it's a mixture of CGI and model making. So they actually huh. kept some of the model making, uh, which is... Um, That's cool. I-, I thought it was very cool. It was a real yeah. homage to the late Jerry Anderson, I thought. So, totally, um, totally. So in saying that, if they've already remade two series, it's it's possible, but I think probably unlikely. Yeah. I, I think the story, to be truthful, is a little bit too simplistic. I think the story works for 1969. I don't think it would work for 2017. Yeah, no, I agree. Also, um, honestly, I had a totally different expectation of this film. Like I say, I went in without doing any homework, so I'm just going off the title, Journey to the Far Side of the Sun. I honestly thought it was going to be, um, God, I don't know. I think maybe I thought I might see some aliens. I really thought it would focus more on the actual journey, but this movie was more about the preparation to the journey and the after effect of the journey. There was very little, yeah, there was very little focus of, actually you know being on this planet and the time they spend on the planet's very 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 short and then like for half a second i was like there's an alien then i'm like no it's not. well yes that's that's obviously <laughs> that's obviously done it that's that scene is done very intentionally and we should explain yeah. to people that um yeah. w- when they crash on the planet well, earth obviously and suddenly there is this light that shines from the sky and mm-hmm. the way it's done, you do like almost think it's an alien spacecraft, and yes. suddenly then this figure emerges. And the other thing that I thought was, and I suppose some people might say this was racist, but I, I don't think it was at the time. Um, it was just meant to show the difference. Was that where they crash is? I believe it's, they're meant to have crashed in China, um, and so the the space, or, and so the rescue operator is speaking Chinese, so. <laughs> So the idea is you've got the light in the sky and you hear it in was Chinese. An alien language. <laughs> I'll say but, it. Yeah, but it it's was yeah. an alien language. So, but, uh, yes, That's but what I, it was supposed to be at the time. You're but, like, oh, my yeah. God, what, what is that? It's an yeah. alien. The alien's talking. And then you're like, it's an Asian man. That's why I don't understand yeah. what it's and, 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 <laughs> yeah, and, and so the idea is actually meant to be that it's meant to just give you those few seconds where you think, oh, my God, there's aliens. And then suddenly you realize, yeah. oh, no, there's not. You know, we are the aliens. You know, yeah. Um, so, well, no, it was fun because you know I'm glad it turned out to be a human because when I saw that fucking alien on a wire, I was like, oh my god, I can see the wire. But then you realize, oh, oh, okay, okay, because it was yeah. He was part actually of a hanging. He was arrested. He was hanging yeah. from a spaceship. Yeah, I know exactly. Um, I was- yeah. <laughs> Uh, I was like, um, where's the teleport beam? He's using a wire. No. Yes, <laughs> I know. I know. I know. And then I was like, okay, I get it. Now I understand now. But at the moment, it gets you for half a second. You're like, oh, it's an alien. Then you're like, oh, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> so if we if we have to rate this one, well, of course we do. Um, okay. Okay. We're, we're, how, how are you going to – how many Eric Roberts points are you Ooh, going to award this you know, one? You um, know, I found this movie really, really, really boring. I found it excruciatingly boring, to be honest. But I like the visuals. I do like the actual story. I hate the ending, but that's subjective. I mean, there's lots of endings that 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 doesn't always have to ruin or make a movie. That's just somebody's opinion. But I hate the ending, but I'm not letting it affect my score. But I okay. just have to throw that out there for people that if you watch this movie, the ending kind of... Yeah, I don't think you're going to see the ending coming at all. I, I, no. I was like, oh, wow, okay, that's how this is going to end. Didn't see that coming. But, yeah, I found it boring, but I like the story. I like the visuals. I like the fashion. Um, I, the acting's actually really good. I don't even think we actually mentioned that. The acting in this is actually quite good. It's, I mean, nobody comes across as silly or unbelievable or like they don't know what their lines are. I mean, it, it's actually really solid acting in this. So it's a very watchable film. 
How much you're going to enjoy it just depends on your pacing tolerance. For me, the pacing was slow, but I'm still going to give this a fair passing grade. I'm going to give this three Eric's out of a possible five Eric's. Wow, that's a lot higher than I thought you were going to go. Phil, yeah, me too. Truthful. I was surprised too. I was like, yeah, um, this is, you know, once we started discussing it, I'm like, no, this is actually a good movie. It's just, but it's it's a challenging movie for some. <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I, I would, I mean, I would say that um, for me, because I'm a huge Jerry Anderson fan, I grew up. As a child with Jerry Ann's, well, not literally, but watching, you know, all of his um, TV shows. Um, so, you know, I am, uh, and if you look at my DVD collection, it is just full of Jerry Anderson. Um, <laughs> so, so because of that, um, I'm going to go higher, but I must admit this movie is dreadfully slow. It is, as mm-hmm. we said, it is dreadfully slow. So, um, mm-hmm. But oh, it's still Jerry Anderson, and I can't <laughs> ever kick the man uh, because I love him. <laughs> um, so basically, I'm going to give it four and a half. Four and a half years. That's not bad. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this definitely fits errors. in the realm of cult classic because, I mean, it really is an original storyline and the overall visuals and the acting. I mean, it really does stand out from a lot of the stuff we've reviewed. Even if I don't find it that enjoyable to watch, it has a lot of going for it. So, oh, I mean, definitely yeah. cult, yeah, definitely oh, cult classic. I, I mean, the thing is that, you know, I, I don't think you can talk cult cinema or cult TV without at some point dealing with Jerry Anderson. You know, he is he's written himself into cult culture, you know, in, in, in that regard. So, uh, so, you know, look, whether you love him or whether you hate his work, whether you're a fan of the Thunderbirds or just thought it was a stupid thing with marionettes, um, you know, whatever – um, Jerry Anderson is definitely, you know, in the cult realm, so he needed to be included. So uh, I'm glad we did it. Yeah, no, definitely. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I saw this because I'm always happy to be introduced to films I haven't seen. There's millions of films in the world. We can't see them all. But, you know, when we look at it and see how many movies we have seen. <laughs> That's just- right. It's really amazing how many movies I've seen, but then there's always something you haven't seen. I mean, well, it, it never gets old. Well, there's well, always the, something. Well, the <laughs> other thing, too, about this podcast is it's not necessarily about – I mean, look, there are cult films that everybody knows, but there are so right. many cult films out there that a lot of people don't know about, and that's the whole reason why we're podcasting, you know, is to right. let people know about these films. So if they haven't heard about them – they can go and track him down, you know? So, yes. Uh, yes. so you know, love them or hate them. Some are going to be good. Some are going to be bad. But they're still in that realm of, you know, of cult cinema. So uh, mm-hmm. there we exactly. go. Exactly. Cool. <laughs> oh, I said it again. I know, I know a lot of people have said they don't like me going, cool. So, oh. <laughs> well, so, that's their problem. Uh, so, I, so I'll just say, <laughs> so I'll say, cool. There we go. Um <laughs> That was probably better. All right. Um, so, uh, yeah, all right. Well, we'll just take a, a quick break, and uh, I think you all know what's coming up next. Yay! It's time to get excited, short film fans. It's mini movie review time. It most certainly is, and uh, we've got an interesting one here. I'm going to use that term, interesting. Um <laughs> And, uh, look, this is your baby, uh, Velvet, so I think let everybody know what we're talking about. Okay, so this week our mini-movie is called Blind Date, and this is from Parted Sky Pictures. Now, I honestly have to admit I almost didn't submit this one for review on the show, but then I was like, you know what? This is still a mini-movie. It's definitely a short film, most definitely, and simply because of the time that it runs. This short runs a li- just a little over 24 minutes, and a lot of times the shorts we review fall within the 10 to 15 minute range. So, you know, I always try to pick those really sh- short films that stay in that short range, and I felt like this is more almost like an episode of a TV show because of the length, but when I watched it, I was like, no, this, this definitely deserves some attention it's won many awards which is always a good sign and i was kind of like i i have so much trouble resisting an award-winning short film because i i I just i'm always drawn in by that because you got to tell so much story in so little time 
So, blind date. Long story short, starts off with a beautiful blind woman on, yes, a blind date. And instantly you like and feel for this girl. So, she's waiting for her date in a cafe. And she's on, like, it's in a cafe that's on a two floors. So, you have to go upstairs, go to the second floor. She's sitting at the table waiting. Her date's walking up the stairs. She can't see him, but she can hear somebody walking up the stairs. So, she thinks it might be him. And she calls out his name. And he doesn't respond, and he tries to walk downstairs, but she hears the stairs creaking. So you instantly just feel bad for this girl, like, oh, my God, her date's trying to skip out on her. So then they end up having the date, like, he comes back up, and and he introduces himself. And turns out she's been putting herself on, you know, dating sites with her phone number, but she's not um, disclosing that she's blind. So this this guy shows up to a date having no idea that he's going to go on a date with a blind woman. And, you know, we all want to be open-minded and, you know, but for some people that's a deal breaker. And <laughs> so for her, this ends up kind of being the last straw. She wants to make a change. She's, you know, but she's a really proactive girl. I mean, you see in this short that she's, you know, going out buying groceries. She's walking around downtown. I mean, she lives by herself. You know, she's hanging out in her cafes. It's even revealed that she goes whitewater rafting. So this is not a helpless, handicapped woman by any means. She just happens to not be able to see the same way that you and I do. So one day when coming home from, you know, grocery shopping, she uh, notices whenever she's feeling around on her doorstep, you know, she has her walking stick, her walking stick hits a little package and she knows right away what it is when her walking stick hits it. So a book has arrived that she has seems to have been expecting. And what kind of book is this? And what does this book do? (laughs) And is the price that she pays for what the book does worth it? Interesting questions that, yeah, these are some questions that might be answered, might not. Definitely leaves you thinking a little bit. This movie shows you a lot, but at the same time, it doesn't tell you everything. So you are left with some questions. And I don't mind when mini movies leave us questioning because that's what keeps us thinking and keeps us coming back to the mini movie. That gives us, that gives it replay value because you can watch it again, see if there's something you missed, see if there's something that hints at one of the questions that you feel didn't get answered. So what did you think about Blind Date, Warren? Well, first thing I've got to say is that it's 10 minutes too long. Okay. It, it, this whole story could have very, very much more neatly be packaged in about, I reckon, 12 minutes. I um, agree. It's, it's a little I bit, do agree. It, it's a little bit like, you know, we spoke about um, uh, Double Ganyo, Journey to the Far Side of the Sun. Mm-hmm. It's exactly the same. It, it draws so much stuff out, and, and this movie mm-hmm. does the same thing. It mm-hmm. takes very simple scenes and draws them out. Um, yeah, that's what I call filler. It has some filler scenes, and yes. I agree. That's why I said I almost didn't want to submit this for a mini-movie review because it almost felt like an episode because on television they have that slot of time that they have to fill. Okay, this is a half-hour show. It has to be half an hour. So I felt like this did have a little bit of filler in it, but I enjoyed the style of the shooting, so I didn't mind oh, yeah. too much. Because you never yeah. quite knew where the filler was going. Here, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's it's um, it's um definitely shot very well. Um, mm-hmm. There's no doubt about that. Um, I, I found the way when they're in the cafe, the way that the um, conversation between her and her blind date starts to develop, that, you know, we think at first that he's probably a bit of a prick. You know, he's a bit yes. of a, uh, right? But mm-hmm. it turns out he's, he's not at all. He's actually, he's a really nice guy. He's actually genuinely interested, but he's just... Mm-hmm. You know, I'm, I'm, and I think it's, it's it's fair to say a lot of people are going to have a second thought in that situation, right. and I, and I right. think for people to say that they wouldn't, I think they're lying. You know, no, um, I agree, and, and it's not just because she's blind. For me, it's the whole concept of if you show up on a date and right at the beginning of the date you find you catch somebody in a lie or they didn't disclose something that they should, that already opens up a can of worms because you're already like, well, what else are they lying about? What else are they not telling me that I should know? So, I mean, well, so it doesn't, yes. it, yeah, it doesn't yeah. even have to apply to her being blind. I mean, I mean, it, that opens up a whole 
thing. Well, <laughs> so it you does. Can talk to a de- yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. it does actually turn out that she is hiding one hell of an extra lie um, <laughs> for why she's actually trying to meet men. Um, now, I'm not going to go down the path to let everybody know why she's trying to meet men. Right. But right. let's just say it's not actually to form a relationship. Shall we just say that? Um, She wants to meet men, but just she needs a man for a different purpose. (laughs) And I'm not and I'm not talking about having children or anything along those lines, all right? (laughs) Yeah, like anything that yeah, anything that you're thinking of that we're saying probably it's not. You're gonna have to watch this and you're just gonna be like, Wow, didn't didn't see that coming. Yes, it's is is it fair for us to say what genre this is? I I don't think that's giving too much away, is um, it? I think you can go for it, because I mean you still have to see this to be like, wow. I mean mean, this this is a horror genre. So hopefully Definitely. So hopefully that will explain what I'm talking about, the way that she needs him for a different purpose. Um Mm -hmm. so let's just say she makes comments of the fact that um, this 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 book arrives. Um, she's blind. She talks about her greatest wish in life would be to see. Mm-hmm. You can start to piece some of these things together. Yeah, um, definitely. And, but, but I don't want to say any more because otherwise it will give the whole the the whole plot away, and I don't want to definitely. do that. But yeah. it's no, it, it, it's good, I, and I really think if. This movie had have been, let's say, cut down. Well, not cut down, because I actually feel like it was actually filled rather than they mm-hmm. had 25 right. minutes. Um, right. You know, because I actually think this is a 12-minute movie which was actually filled out to 25 minutes. I um, agree. Yeah, is it's the way it sort of seems to me. But it's still good. I still liked it. I still enjoyed mm-hmm. it. Um, mm-hmm. But, oh, and this is really hard to say because I myself don't make movies. Mm-hmm. But I don't know. I think it just it could, it was just lacking something. I, mm-hmm. I really think this movie was just lacking something. Um, okay. But uh, and I don't really know what it was. But there was just something missing from this. That. Um, mm-hmm. But it's still good. I, I, I'd still recommend people to see it without any doubt. Mm-hmm. Do you think it's lacking because it is a mini movie? Because I feel that sometimes mini movies do constantly leave something le- like leave you wanting more, as in you feel like something is missing and i often let that slide because it is a mini movie because i'm like you know if i want it to be totally fleshed out and be a totally full film it needs to be a feature length film so i oftentimes i give movies a pass when i feel like it's lacking something do you feel like it's probably lacking because it is a mini movie no no not in this case i'm not going to give them a pass in this case because Mm -hmm. the 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 simple fact is they had 25 minutes they had more than enough time Mm -hmm. um you know i mean I, I know they want us to leave thinking, okay, but I still think they needed to tell us a little bit more. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, there was just um, it, it was it was just too slow for my mind. It was just mm-hmm. um, yeah, it, yeah, and, and it just it was just lacking. It was lacking something to fill that twenty five minutes, or mm-hmm. don't have that extra something, but run it mm-hmm. as a twelve minute film. You know, it, okay. it's that that's just the way I see it. Um, okay. Yeah. No, that's fair. That's a fair assessment. Yeah. What did you think of the acting in this movie? Oh, acting I thought was good. Um, I actually thought when they were their date conversation is actually, mm-hmm. to me, actually seemed pretty realistic. Like it, yeah. it felt, it felt very real. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it had that sort of, you know, you know what a first date is like. Um, <laughs> it, it's like I've never been on a date. I don't know. Re- oh yeah, right. <laughs> um, the um, but it, 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 you know, you got that nervousness. You don't I know what kidding. to see. Yeah, of course, I know you. Do. <laughs> um, um, you've got that nervousness. You don't really know what yeah. to say. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and and you've also got that problem where you've got those awkward silence. You know, because you mm-hmm. just don't know each other at all, and um, and and also you can't just. I mean, it's like when two people meet for the first time and they become friends. It's sort of so different because you can just talk about shit and it doesn't mm-hmm. matter. You can't right. do that on a date. You know no. what I mean? Because you're scared no. you're going to bore the other person or they're going to think you're stupid. <laughs> Um, but but if it's if it's a you're meeting a friend for the first time you can say whatever you like you know right. and um and, and so you can really feel that awkwardness there so I thought they did a really good job actually 
Yeah, you the know? acting is really point on. All, and also the actress in this has actually won the award as best actress in a short film. So, I mean, well-deserved for her performance. Um, there's also an effective use of music and jump scares and even sound effects in this short. I thought they did a good job. Oh, yeah. I actually, I actually um, listened to this with headphones on, which, whoo, yeah, the first jump scare, I probably jumped a little too hard because of that. But, yeah, very effective use of jump scares in this. Um, there's a little bit of special effects, which are quite interesting. Yes. Um, the story is not spoon-fed to you. There's a lot left open. Like, it gives you – it's very loose. Like, it does give you an idea of what – is going on almost exactly but at the same time you're kind of like well wait a minute how the wait how did how did she this how did she that so but yeah it's definitely worth checking out especially if you like horror shorts because those are always fun and this is a, a unique story it's not uh, something you see often in feature length films so it's interesting to see it as a short film yeah no it's it, it it's good um i i just yeah, look, I, I've said what I thought, but I, it, it's um, <laughs> it's it's uh, but no, no, but I, I liked it. Yeah, I, I, I still liked it. Um, the the acting was at saving grace. I actually thought. Yeah, you no, know, I that, agree. That was at saving I agree. Grace. I agree. The acting was very good, and the special effects and just the cinematography in this, I actually quite enjoyed. Oh, okay, it's so shot you beautifully. Wanted, yeah, shot yeah, beautifully. it is, really is. It's actually really pretty for what it is. It's really pretty, <laughs> um, <laughs> considering. Um, okay, so the short film is called Blind Date, a, a romantic nightmare. You can find it on, on Vimeo or Vimeo. I always used to say Vimeo. 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 Dot yeah. Com. yeah <laughs> Vimeo. Dot com. It's Blind Date, A Romantic Nightmare. You can also go to the website of partedskypictures.com. You know, let's part the sky. Partedskypictures.com. And they have it right there on their site. Just click Blind Date. And that will take you to the link where you can watch Blind Date. So when you got 30 minutes to fill with some horror, we recommend this short. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, no, that was a good one. No, you found, you, you, you did us proud again, Velvet. <laughs> you did us proud again <laughs> all right well we'll just take a uh, quick break and we will be back with a movie review um number two well at least we will if i play the filler <laughs> there we go god i always get this wrong <laughs> never mind <laughs> Well, we're back with movie number two, and we're back in Britain again um, with our second offering. Uh, but of course, uh, Double Ganya, Journey to the Far Side of the Sun was a British film. And uh, so we've got a second one, and it is Absolute Beginners from 1986. <laughs> and this is an interesting movie. Um, it... <laughs> It bombed terribly at the box office, <laughs> which was a shame because it was meant to be the saving grace of the British film industry, and Oops. it did the exact reverse, unfortunately. Oh, um, so that was a real shame. Um, but it's from 1986, and it really does have an all-star cast of the music industry of the time. I think that's pretty fair to say, though, um, Velvet? Yeah, totally. Um, this is definitely, this movie is a musical. <laughs> yes, <laughs> So if it you don't is. like musicals, don't watch this. And because this one's like almost nonstop sing and dance numbers, which honestly, I don't mind. I like musicals, but if it's nonstop for, and this movie is almost two hours long, uh, it's almost nonstop sing and dance. Uh, and you're, if you're not familiar with the songs, the first time you watch this movie, it can honestly be a little exhausting to constantly be hearing new music, seeing the new dance moves, and you know, you're tr and you have to really pay attention because you know the story is being told through song, so you have to really pay attention to what they're singing. But then sometimes the songs don't mean anything, and it's just you know a fun you know part of the movie. But you're still having to pay attention, so you're just like, what's going on? Is this part of the story, or is this just entertainment? Is this a message? What? What's going on? It's, no, but, yeah. it, <laughs> but it is actually, it's really fun, actually. It's really fun. But it's the first time going in, 
be ready for a lot of singing, a lot of dancing. There's oh, no, yeah. well, there's no like 20 minutes of dialogue, two minute song, 20 minutes of dialogue, two minute song. No, this is almost nonstop singing and dancing. So <laughs> it's the, the, the most imperative movie. A lot of people have often tried to compare it to, I don't know if that's quite fair, but a movie they often compare it to is West Side Story. Um, yeah. Now, it's mm-hmm. it's actually really nothing like West Side Story, but I, but you can see the similarities, I suppose. Right, um, right. You can definitely see the similarities. Now, um, it's not actually copied off anything like that. It is, in fact, taken from a British book, um, which mm-hmm. was written about life um, in London in the late 50s. Uh, so, mm-hmm. um, the... Um, uh, I suppose we should just give a brief, a very brief rundown of what the film yeah. is about. Now, mm-hmm. um, it, it, it basically uh, revolves around uh, two of our characters, Colin, who is a want-to-be sort of like photojournalist, um, very much into his music, into the mod sort of lifestyle, um, you know, wants to be a success, um, and mm-hmm. his girlfriend, uh, Crepe Suzette. Uh, yes, <laughs> Crepe Suzette, um, which is, uh, um, and she wants it exactly the same thing. She wants to be famous, she wants to be wealthy, um, and unfortunately, their desires, although virtually the same, will lead them into slightly different directions until mm-hmm. they will find that true love will, of course, bring them back together. Um, it, it's, uh, as I said, set in the 1950s, and it's uh, in London. And it's it's a time, um, because it's, it's meant to be 1958. And, of yes. course, this was a time when... Uh, it was post-war Britain. Britain was coming out of things like rationing. Remember, you know, if you're a US listener and stuff, you, you know, when the war ended, rationing, I mean, you guys could still eat whatever you wanted. In Britain, they were still having food rationing until the 60s. So, Ugh. you know, you, you've got it. They were no different to the rest of Western Europe. Life was hard in Europe, mm-hmm. you know, through the 50s. And, um, and of course, mm-hmm. everybody was looking to the United States. And so this movie develops that idea of the love of jazz music, um, the Mm -hmm. love of American fashion, um, the the American dream, which they're all sort of looking for. But it's all written with that undertone of, of course, Mm -hmm. new post-war immigration to Britain, which was coming Mm -hmm. from places like Africa. And, of course, you then start the white versus black uh, problem mm-hmm. and yeah um the then the last little bit just to tie it all together is that there is an evil man in this uh called uh <laughs> henley and uh assisted uh by um oh i've forgotten his david name bowie. Now, by basically <laughs> by, by david, david bowie. bowie um and uh, <laughs> i've forgotten i've forgotten the, the name of his character though and, I uh, David Bowie. <laughs> and they're actually trying to kick all of the black people out of the neighborhood so they can build a shopping mall uh oh, yeah, and yeah. uh and then of course yeah, yeah, all yeah. hell will break <laughs> loose and of course we will see Really, in a sense, a singing and dancing homage to the, well, London has had many race riots, but obviously it turns <laughs> into a race riot. Um, and of course, but our uh, main stars, uh, Colin and Susie, will of course, through that race riot, re-embrace and find true love. Um, it's Look, this is, I, I reckon this is actually a really good story, but the problem is, because it is a musical, um, not a lot of people were drawn to it. They just thought that, oh, this right. is a load of crap. But right. but the interesting thing is that in latter years, this has written itself now as a British cult classic. Like, people say, mm-hmm. have you seen that movie with David Bowie called Absolute Beginners? Wow, it's amazing. But at oh, my the, gosh. You know, yeah. But at the time, it was just like... This is not what the British public were hoping for. And, right. um, you know, and, and that was a shame. But, like, for instance, but we just named some of the stars in this. Uh, Crepe Suzette was played by uh, Patsy Kensett, uh, you know, mm-hmm. huge British star. Um, Eddie mm-hmm. O'Connell played Colin. David Bowie plays the advertising executive. Um, mm-hmm. James Fox, I mean, he's a huge British star, um, you know, mm-hmm. played Henley. Um, mm-hmm. Ray Davies plays Colin's father. Um, you know, and then we've got a whole heap of singers. You know, well, obviously Ray Davies is in there. But Sade, mm-hmm. you know, if everyone mm-hmm. remembers Sade, has a major yeah. role in this. I mean, it is it is 
filled with the who's who of the British music industry at the time, all playing different roles. Um, yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's, it's amazing. Oh, okay. I'll take a quick break. <laughs> You go for it. Yeah. Um, well, the way you're describing the film is spot on. Um, this movie has very busy, busy, busy cinematography. It's kind of like the only thing I can liken it to is kind of like Moulin Rouge, where some people can't handle that movie with a. Uh, uh, Ewan McGregor and Nicole Kidman because people are constantly singing and dancing and moving around and jumping towards the screen and the camera's flying all over the place and this is kind of like that. There's just constantly like you're even when the main character Colin is like narrating and talking about stuff and he's walking through the city and he's taking pictures there's always like a ton of shit going on around him you see people pickpocketing, you see guys pinching women's asses you see people walking into a car and walking out the other end i mean there's always just something going on there's a ton like if you watch this movie again and again you're always going to see something you didn't see before because just like people randomly dancing and (laughs) doing flips and it's very busy uh cinematography i mean it's actually i think it's actually really fun to watch but like i said at the same time it can be really strenuous your first time watching it because you're not really sure where you're supposed to focus in when you watch the movie because it's you know you can look all over the place and you're there's something for you to look at um the, the dialogue in this movie is actually quite colorful it's not just straight hi how are you oh that's nice oh that's good to hear they use like a lot of slang and they really um there's a lot of different accents you know you have the posh accents and then you have the the uh, cockney sounding and you have there's some honestly some accents where i'm just kind of like <laughs> like it's what it sounds like to me i just can't understand yeah. them very well it's like i have to hear it a few times to catch what they're saying so i mean like that's another thing that can wear the listener out if you're not used to that variety of english accents in one movie <laughs> so i mean there's this is definitely not a boring movie it'll definitely keep your attention but it also might leave you feeling a little tired towards the end just because there's so much uh going on this movie though made me chuckle consistently because there was just so much so much um it's ridiculously campy, but in all the right ways. I mean, just, you know, because it's a musical and they ham it up and they're not afraid to do that and they don't take itself too seriously. But this movie caught me off guard because it did have really serious messages in it. Oh, yes. You know, about, you know, like, well, if you're in love with someone, but they're keeping you from pursuing your dreams, you know, do you end that relationship or do you stick it out? I mean, the whole race message got really fucking serious in this movie. I, that really, I was just like, whoa what happened to this movie because the whole time it's really campy and you think it's kind of a love story but then like the last like 20 minutes half hour of the movie it's this huge violent race war and there's like the union of the fascists and they have they're dropping in bombs and when i say in bombs i'm saying the n word as we like to say in the united states to be politically correct and that i did not expect to see people saying that word and spray painting it on walls and see signs with the n word on it in this movie but at the same time, they weren't doing it to be shocking. They were just, you know, adding realism and also telling the story of this is how serious this is right now, that there's a big group of ignorant people that think that foreigners should go home and that, you know, if you're a different color, it doesn't matter if you were born here. You just, you know, you don't belong here. You're all you're automatically a second class citizen or you shouldn't be a citizen at all. So I had a really ridiculously serious message. Um, but I did like the union. I, I mean, I didn't like them, but the union of the fascists, that was kind of funny because it just showed you how ridiculous and over the top some people are when it comes to hate crimes and hate movements. So I did actually oh, like yeah. that they put that in there. But I honest, I honestly was not happy about seeing the sign that they had that said deport all niggers. I mean, I was just like, whoa, did they really put that sign in the movie? So I just want to drop that for people. So when you see that movie, I don't want you to be like, oh, this is going to be a cute musical with David Bowie. This movie has a really serious message it's, towards it's, the end. So be prepared for that. Be prepared for that. But it's not it doesn't ruin the movie, but it just takes it in a totally different direction. Then it brings it back around. So stick in there. You know, don't let the racial slurs throw you you off because they don't do it just for shock value and actually i don't think they do it for shock value at all actually, no, it actually not does. at all surprisingly surprisingly actually it fits into the movie because the entire movie um this, the characters are very ethnically diverse and they're really getting along but also there's always that underlying theme of not everybody's okay with interracial situations and you are going to deal with some ignorant races or excuse me, racists, excuse me, ignorant racists. Yes. <laughs> and 
So, I mean, be prepared for that, but it's not, it doesn't ruin the movie. It's, it, but they, it's in there. <laughs> Let me just oh, say it's, it's in there. I, I mean, yeah, <laughs> the, the use of, shall we say, a very racist language in this movie. Yes. Um, yes. Is the, the, the thing is that, yeah, this is not, as you said, it's not done for shock value at all. They're, right. they are making a real statement about just how evil, you know, these white supremacists are. You know, in our world, I exactly. mean, these are not nice people. These are nasty fuckers. You know, and um, yes, and, yes. And, and, and in this movie, they do that. They don't try to dull down just how evil the white supremacy movement is, and uh, and so they show it. You know, warts and all. You know, and, mm-hmm. and the, but the other thing too that I, I did like is. Um, when it does show that movement, which is in this called the, mm-hmm. uh, was it the Union of Fascists? Um, yes, yes. It's um, you know, like, when, for instance, you know, they have this, what, what is it, their, their slogan? What is it? Uh, make oh, Britain white. Oh, um, oh, God, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, mm-hmm. and, and the thing is that, I mean, what's, I suppose, fascinating about it is that they are used um, uh, by the, shall we say, the banks and the business people to do mm-hmm. their dirty work to make money. It's like what's fascinating right. about this film is the character of uh, James Fox and the character of David Bowie, they're not mm-hmm. racist. They don't mm-hmm. hate black people. They just mm-hmm. want to clear out the black people so they can build something and they mm-hmm. use these evil people to do their dirty work. And mm-hmm. I hate to say it, that this story is not that dissimilar from what's been going on. Well, I don't need to go any further. I think people know what I'm saying. You know, Exactly. Like- I mean, this is a common theme throughout history that there's a certain race in any country that is always targeted and people want to clear them out because that just happens to be a certain area that they inhabit and they're kind of like you know if we clear that area out and we've knocked down those buildings we could build a shopping mall we could build a parking lot <laughs> and, that's the thing yeah i mean it's it is a consistent theme throughout many societies and across different races that get persecuted so i mean it's I, but yeah i was really surprised that this movie the entire time i'm just like oh this is fun and it's so silly and it's got such a loose plot and they're singing and they're dancing then all of a sudden this like huge like violent i mean like there's fight scenes people you know at one point you think somebody's going to get killed and you're like holy shit this got a serious but then like they bring it back around and it has a nice happy ending so that's cool but i'm just like whoa i yeah i just was not expecting this serious message in this movie at all <laughs> oh yes yeah. so we, we we have to remember of course that you know as we said this is from 1986 and um yeah of course britain you know had was going through at that time and had come through through the late 70s and early 80s some horrific race riots um mm-hmm. you know horrific race riots and so the, the movie was really a statement of its time it may have been set in the movie in 1958 but it mm-hmm. was definitely talking about 1980s britain um mm-hmm. so you know uh so in some ways maybe it was a little bit too close to the bone for a lot of people you know at that mm-hmm. time i you know mm-hmm. I, I, I don't it know could but be. That could um, be. But, but I think the message, you know, was good. But the other thing about this film is the cinematography is amazing. Yes, yes, It, it yes. is It is amazing. The colours and everything that they use. Um, yes. Uh, the clothing, you know, the, 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 in this is just amazing. And uh, it's so um, – and the use of going from – dark imagery to amazingly bright imagery mm-hmm. you know uh, yes. so it is 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 quite quite astounding and the other thing too is that there are three scenes in this that that, that people always talk about who are big fans of this movie and that is that um one is ray davies uh, of course i think we all know who ray davies is but um mm-hmm. the um uh, he plays of course the father of colin and uh <laughs> There is an amazing scene where he sings a song or sings and dances a song called The Quiet Life. Now, <laughs> this is absolutely amazing the way they shot this because yeah. the, the set is like, imagine, you know, like those old fashioned dolls houses where you yes. opened up the back and there was yes. a staircase up the middle and the rooms on either side. And it's yes. shot like that. It's They open up the back of the house and it's a doll's house, but they're all inside it singing and dancing. Yes. And it is absolutely <laughs> amazing to see. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's all kinds of crazy shit going on, too. This movie is really funny and it's ridiculously campy, but like I said, in all the right ways. And But that number, okay, 
okay, I did like this movie, but there were some parts where I'm just like, okay, because it's not, almost nonstop singing and dancing almost the entire movie. But it got to a point, for me, honestly, there were some songs where I'm just like, and but, but every musical is guilty of this. Some musicals just have filler songs. And this one I felt like in the beginning, like almost every song really applied to the plot and was moving the story forward. Then it got to a point where I'm like, every time they introduce like a new song and dance number, I'm like, okay, now you're just doing filler. This is not moving this story forward. And I kind of felt like the Ray Davies song didn't really totally add to the story. At the same time, it was kind of saying, okay, there's the generation that they don't have aspirations of being famous. You know, they lived through the, they've lived through war. They've seen the city burn and, you know, they're just happy to have peace and quiet. So, I mean, but it goes so long and there's so much crazy shit going on. So basically his wife, they're running like, they're like letting tenants stay at the house, you know, yes, out rooms. Know. and his wife is basically having sex with all of them. And then like his son is wearing his mother's bra and jacking off. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know it's like, crazy. Isn't it? What is going on? And it's funny because the father's like, they think I don't know what's going on. He's like, I know. I would just pre- prefer to act like I don't know and not deal with the drama. And it's actually really funny, but it's it so outrageous. Yeah. And I think even at one point, this one guy that was having sex with this kid's mom is trying to have sex with his brother, and he's just the one that's yes. wearing the mother's bra. <laughs> I know. Like, oh my god, this is so silly. It's all over the place. And the way yeah. it, and the way it, it just all happens within each room. As Ray yeah, Davies yeah. basically sings his song walking, or not actually walking, he's dancing <laughs> from room to room. It is, it is apps, and he's like, yeah, there's like, they think I don't know, but I do, you know. Yeah, um, it it's is, really funny, actually. Yeah, it, it, yeah. Is, it is very good. But And the other, the next scene, of course, which is the one which, uh, you know, you hop on YouTube and just do a search on this, and it is David Bowie um, uh, scene. Uh, as the mm-hmm. advertising executive uh, with mm-hmm. Eddie O'Connell, and that is mm-hmm. this is an amazing little um, little number uh, where yeah, it, is. it starts it is. in the advertising agency, and then it just explodes into props mm-hmm. and something from like a huge Broadway musical. It is just you know it it is absolutely unbelievable you know to see, and and when you do see it too, it just reminds you of just you know. We lost such an amazing man last year, you know, in, oh, in yeah. David Bowie. Yeah. I mean, when mm-hmm. you see him, this his ability to move, um, you know, not just as a singer but as a dancer, it's just absolutely amazing. He had, he just had that stage presence because he definitely wasn't the best singer on the planet, but he always had that artistic quality about him, that je ne sais quoi that I, I love to throw that phrase out that I always say actors, certain actors have, and David, David Bowie had that as an artist. And I remember seeing him in interviews saying that he didn't even consider him himself a singer he considered himself more of an artist Artist, and i can see why yeah because he would move from medium to medium like that and yeah this is a really fun movie to see him and he actually has kind of a small part but then they do give him that one song and dance number and it is you could really have that on its own just as a music video just for the visual enjoyment oh it is it it is in fact velvet that scene (laughs) was actually (laughs) turned into a music video it was so popular yeah. See, there you go. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there you go. The, the, but, the, but the other thing, too, about this, we were talking about David Bowie, is that David Bowie was not actually meant to be in this film. He was never cast to be in this film. He was actually mm-hmm. contacted by producers to write a number of the songs for this. Um, because he, mm-hmm. of course, also writes the theme music uh, to this uh, to this song. You yeah. can go on YouTube mm-hmm. and just look up, you know, Absolute Beginners, and, and there is a, the song there. Um mm-hmm. But so he was asked to write a couple of songs for it. And anyway, he was given the book and apparently he said he didn't really like the book very much. He thought it was a a bit dull. But then he was Mm -hmm. given a script um, for an early script for the movie so he could read that to help him write the music. And he fell in love with it so much. He said, I will only write the music if you give me the character of the advertising agent. (laughs) <laughs> yeah and uh the way he plays the advertising agent he has a very interesting style of speaking because for half a second i thought he was trying to pull off an american accent but no he was just ah. trying to do that over he was trying to do that very over executive talk 
So the good thing yeah. I would catch slight hints, slight hints of his English accent, this, but he was trying to be very, you know, very loud and very strong. And we sell dreams, not products. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a story. There's actually a, there's actually a story behind that, Velvet, because okay. the um, the advertising agent, you know, with that accent, okay, because a lot of mm. people have complained about the accent. They say, what the fuck is it? It's not British. <laughs> it's not American. One minute it's British, one minute it's an American. And, and, and they're sort right. of saying, oh, well, he didn't act that very well, but it's all all done intentionally, and it's based off people he used to work for. Um, apparently, when one of his very first jobs uh, he got, when he was still actually called, uh, was it David Jones? Um, he worked mm-hmm. in a, he worked in an advertising agency as um, one of the bottom run artists, sketch artists, and he said it was mm-hmm. really quite amazing that. Um, that back then in the like in the uh, the sixties, he said in his British advertising companies, everyone would speak with their British accents, and then he said you'd go to the upper floors where all the management were, like the directors and all the rest of it, and he said, and they were all speaking with American accents, <laughs> but and he said it's like, but hang on, you were born in Birmingham. Well, why are you speaking with an American accent? And, and apparently, but he said the American accents were so bad because, um, and so that's the reason why it's done. It's done intentionally to, to, act, yeah, to actually mock like the British advertising uh, industry in the 1960s. So there you go. I love it. That's great. Yeah, there that's you go. great. I love that. And, that's great. Yeah, the and, music in this is quite catchy. And oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and the very final scene, which is the one that everyone always talks about, is the race riot at the very end, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which is basically all the fighting is choreographed dance. Mm-hmm. Which is exactly quite, it's, it's quite astounding to watch, actually. You know, yeah. it's quite astounding to watch. So, anyway, no, I've, um, I've spoken enough. You, you don't, you don't know. <laughs> no, um, actually, I was going to, that's actually, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you brought that up again because actually, I was going to say the music in this is quite catchy and the choreography in this is really well done. That actually, when it gets to the race wars, to be honest, it is so, like, the visual imagery and what's going on is so jarring that it doesn't even come across like they're dancing. Like, it doesn't downplay the seriousness of the situation that they're yeah. dancing. Like, I was actually, like, I was actually a little bit on edge watching these scenes of the race war, because even though they were dancing, like I said, it it was very un- much understood that they're fighting, and this is serious, and somebody's going to get hurt, and somebody might die, and, you know, just... Uh, it, wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. It, it, it is. It's a, it is. It, I mean, look, it's, it's, it's astounding. Yeah, I mean, when Colin and, and um, uh, Crepe, <laughs> I think he just calls her Suzette, actually, throughout most of the yeah, movie. Yeah. Um, when exactly. they're, they're, they're trying to run away, you know, obviously, because they've got the white supremacists r- chasing after them. <sighs> And the problem, too, is they've also got the black community chasing after them because they've been caught up in the middle of this race riot. So the mm-hmm. problem is that the black community see them as white, so they think they're the enemy, mm-hmm. even though they're mm-hmm. on the side of the black people. They're not actually on the, the white right. supremacist side. So they're being mm-hmm. chased and hunted down through by both sides um, mm-hmm. while basically the east end of London burns as the white supremacists basically set the place on fire. Um, and then you've got... All this fighting going on, you know, as they're dancing while these two are trying to escape. It's it is absolutely stunning. It's a stunning cinematography. Mm-hmm. It really is. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really cool. Okay, we we have to talk about the teenage pimp because I was just like, oh <laughs> yes, little, is, is this little boy seriously pimping a woman out? It just it cracked me up because it's funny how this movie was able to pull that off and it was just so comical instead of being like appalled because you know how sensitive i can be about children and certain depictions of film and for some reason this one made me laugh the entire time like right in the beginning of this movie you see like uh you see like just a random kid that doesn't have a main uh doesn't have a main role in the movie but he keeps popping up randomly in the movie right in the beginning you see a kid like drinking alcohol in the street and then you see him going up to a prostitute and trying and he's counting change in his hand trying to make a deal with her yes <laughs> i'm like wait what then later you see like an i think actually the same kid you see him like pinching a woman's ass and it but somehow it's so funny the way they do it but then they have the other uh character that this guy like he's always p- picking pockets and he's always got some, some kind of racket going he even says straight up like he's always doing illegal shit for money he's always scamming people for money and he even straight up at one point says here's my new racket but and basically he was saying he was being a pimp and i'm like 
How old is this kid? <laughs> it's well, I, I think it's I, I think it's great, and it makes such a, a great statement because it's like you know, in, in the east end and east end of London, I mean, they're very proud of their history and their origins, mm-hmm. and and, mm-hmm. and the east end of London may no longer you know be what it was. Um, you know, it's, mm-hmm. it's now got wealthy people moved in and, and all the rest of it. But, um, but you know, its origins there was pure poverty. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and so the idea that, you know, they bring them up young, you know, you're going to have racketeers who were kids, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. a, a, and in the fifties, that's what it was like, you know, I mean, kids had to survive. I mean, you had single, you remember too, you had families being raised by single parents. I mean, you just think about this, how many families had lost a father, um, Ooh, you know, coming mm-hmm. out of the Second World War. Um, oh, yeah. they, they'd faced the huge brunt of German bombing for, you know, basically three years straight. Yeah, um, and they show that in this movie that people are living in these fucked up buildings that are just destroyed and people are living there. Like, one point a landlord's trying to collect rent and somebody says to him, well, you need to put a fucking roof on that building if you're going to charge him rent. Yeah. And people are living in those, you know, fucked up, you know, building that's obviously been damaged from wartime and i was just like wow you know and, and i think i think that's the thing i mean for people who are old enough well hopefully we've got some listeners probably not but some <laughs> listeners you know who would remember the 50s um in europe i mean it was the late 40s you know and 50s it was as we said at the start talking about this movie it was a hard time it, it wasn't like Ooh. being brought up in the united states or um or canada or australia you know we were wealthy countries. We were wealthy mm-hmm. countries where war had yeah. not touched us, you know. But for these mm-hmm. guys, you know, they, they'd gone through hell. They had gone mm-hmm. through sheer hell. And, um, you know, and it took a long time to rebuild, you know, it took a very long time to rebuild. So, you know, and they show all of that. But they also show that that desire to be better, you know, like they, they're not just sitting back giving up. They all want to be mm-hmm. better. They want to be richer. They want to be more educated. They want to... Except like, for Ray you know, Davies. He just oh, wants, he he wants, just to, wants a quiet he, he life. He pretend nothing's going on. I know. I know. Um, <laughs> but you, you're always going to have people like that, aren't you, in, in life? You know, it's like, oh, I remember the yeah, good old days. Yeah. yeah the yeah, German bombs yeah. were dropping, but oh, I mustn't grumble, you know. <laughs> uh, and, and, and you're always going to have people. I, I remember my, my, I think my grandmother used to be a bit like that. You know, it's like, oh, there was the war, but yeah, they were good times. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, yeah, you know it's, a, it's, it's, well, if you think about it though, too, I mean, I've heard a lot of people say this who lived through the war in, not so much in Europe, because that was kind of horrific, but in Britain, especially where, they were being bombed, but they were never invaded. But so the the mm-hmm. concept of a lot of them was that they found that life started where people bonded with each other. People started talking mm-hmm. to each other who wouldn't normally talk to each other. People started mm-hmm. helping each other who normally wouldn't help each mm-hmm. other. And when the war I was uh, yeah, and when the war ended, it was almost like they didn't want to lose that spirit that they had gained during the war. And and I think that's okay. why you often find. We're talking much older people now. We're talking people in their 80s, you know, uh, um, yeah. who, who, who you will sometimes sort of say they were, even it was it was horrific, but they were sort of good times. Um, right. And, and I think that's the reason why. They miss that culture, you know. So getting off track a little bit, but I think that's the that's the reason why <laughs> we've got that well, Ray this Davies, you know. this is a heavy know? movie. I mean, this is a heavy movie because it starts off really lighthearted and funny and just all over the place and really colorful, and then it hits you with these really heavy messages. So, you know, be prepared for that, people that want to check this out. Be prepared for a lot of singing and dancing. It's a very loose plot. So, you know, because at first you think it's going to be about this guy trying to get his girlfriend back, essentially, and it turns into so much more. But at the same time, it's very loosely plotted because there's really long song and dance numbers, one right after the other, right after the other, that I said sometimes I felt like didn't really move the story forward. They were just enjoyable to watch and listen to. But then, like, all of a sudden, it almost feels like out of nowhere, but it really was building up to this the entire time. You just don't know it until it happens, which is kind of like how it is in life like when these riots and these race wars happen i mean there were warning signs all along until the camel you know the straw comes along that breaks the camel's back and it all hell breaks loose and that's kind of what this musical is like yes but then like eventually it, it subsides and everybody calms down and 
comes to an understanding again for the most part there will always be conflict <laughs> in society yes. but 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 this movie does a nice job of like kind of calming it back down and then kind of going okay you remember this guy and this girl and they're in love and we want them to be together okay we're going to get them together and have a happy ending for this so. <laughs> well it's it's a, it's a little bit like it, it reminds me of a little bit of a, a, a another film actually from a, a similar time period uh pink floyd's the wall um do you remember that Velvet. Oh, yeah, um, and, yeah, that's and, a good one. There and we and go. And it's it's it, that's actually if we're going to talk about a musical cult movie, that is actually one that maybe we should consider. Um, at, oh, at some absolutely. Stage. But it is interesting that um, although maybe not, because I need to say something about this, which will give away the end of the movie. Not that that matters for the wall. Actually, I don't think that matters. Um, no, no, that, no, for the um, wall, that's with, okay. <laughs> yeah, with, I mean, with the wall. I mean, you know, we start off with Britain in the Second World War you know, all the horrors, all the terrors, and then we move into modern 1980s uh, British life and there's the drugs, there's the booze, there's the sex, um, you know, and, and everything goes wrong. And then what happens? We embrace fascism once again, you know, mm. and, and, and then the world turns into civil war between fascism and the anti-fascists. And then when it's all over, how does the wall finish? by a young girl walking through the rubble and she finds a Molotov cocktail. And what does she do? She pours the petrol out and keeps the bottle. <laughs> and it's such a lovely little message that nice. no matter how yeah. bad shit gets, hopefully the next generation will make it right, you know? Right. And, uh, mm-hmm. and I love that little statement by uh, that's in the wall. And this movie is, is a bit like that. You know, it's like we mm-hmm. go through all this shit, but you know what? We can still have a happy ending, no matter how bad life gets. Yes, you yes. know, and well said. And, and I, yeah, well and I, said. and I, and I, yeah. I think that's really good. Um, the other thing too is um, that if you are a fan of British music of the nineteen eighties, then you will love the soundtrack. You'll love the songs in this. Now, mm-hmm. I know for a lot of people, you know, if you're American or Canadian or South African or I don't, I don't know Ukrainian then obviously a lot of this music may actually be quite new to you. You actually won't mm-hmm. have heard it before. Um, but, right. you know, but for if you were into British music in the 1980s, this is just a little time capsule as well because the music isn't 1950s music. It's all 1980s mm-hmm. music, even though yes. it's set in the 50s. Um, yes. You know, so you've got people like Sade, Ray Davies. Um, you, you've got people like uh, David Bowie. And you've also got, like, for instance, um, because British ska music was huge at this period of time. So we've got ska rats in there who, like, no one will know who they are now, but back then it's mm-hmm. like, oh, my God, that's the, you know. So mm-hmm. this, this was big. I mean, the amount... Of, uh, they literally just creamed the crop of the British music industry, you know, when they made this. Uh, so, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of that is going to be lost on younger viewers today. Right. You know, but uh, but hey, that's life. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I reckon it's probably time to rate this one. What do you reckon, Velvet? Okay. All right. Let's do that. So um, I'm going to say this is a musical for people who really, really like musical musicals. This is for hardcore musical lovers. If you just occasionally like musicals or you can't stand musicals, you're not going to like this at all because it's it's really nonstop. I honestly liked it, but I did find it a little strenuous. I found some of the stories, or excuse me, I found some of the song and dance numbers didn't help further the story and actually kind of slowed the pacing. I did find this a little strenuous to watch just, just because there's so much going on, so much music, and you have to pay attention attention really to make sure you're not missing plot points in song and dance numbers so this is very watchable it is definitely checking out at least one time especially if you're a david bowie fan you definitely want to check out his uh, performance in this although it's rather short um so i'm going to give this a uh, out of a five possible eric roberts i'm going to give this three eric's okay that's still not bad um I am probably going to go a little bit higher um, because I am a child of the 80s. So I've got a couple of years on you, Velvet. So, um, um, you know, I still remember the 80s, uh, even though I was – obviously, I was young, but I still remember them. Um, mm-hmm. the, the, um, uh, the thing for me is that, I mean, some of the people in this – I mean, James Fox. I mean, James Fox was uh, – it just – 
a huge British actor. I mean, you remember him, I mean, uh, you know, from movies like King Rat, that amazing, you know, Hollywood movie about prisoners of war. Um, you know, he was just an amazing actor. And, you know, and the fact that he's in it. You've got David Bowie. I mean, Patsy Kenzer. I, I was in love with Patsy Kenzer, you know, I mean, you know, and uh, she's gorgeous now. But when mm-hmm. you see her in this, she is just... Mm-hmm. You know, absolutely beautiful. So, you know, and Sade, I, I, I think I own every Sade album there is. And, you know, so to have her in this movie, it's, it's, it's just great. And, uh, so, uh, and the other thing I will just quickly say is that, um, yes, it is a musical, but this is not like, watching Camelot. This is not like watching, you know, <laughs> um, you know, that sort of more traditional musical. This is, this is hardcore musical. Is maybe the mm-hmm. way to say it, you know. So yes. this is hardcore. Yes. So, um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So if you're thinking musicals like you remember, you know, from the 1960s and 70s, no, nah, this is <laughs> hardcore. So um, I'm mm-hmm. going to give it a four. Okay. Four Eric's. Yeah. I think it's really good. Yeah. Most definitely. definitely. All right. So, uh, well, we've got one more to go, haven't we, Velvet? So, um, we, (laughs) I am actually just stalling at the moment because I can't find the right track. Here we go. So, (laughs) so we will be right back. Oh, there it goes. Here it comes. God, I don't know. I get this wrong every time. Who cares? We'll be back in just a moment. Now, movie number three. I keep saying that, but it's actually really movie number four, isn't it? Because we don't include the sh- we don't include the mini movie, think- do we? Yeah, I you always know? think of it as movie number three. Yeah, I always yeah, think of it as I know, movie I know. Number three. So anyway, movie number three <laughs> is from <laughs> nineteen seventy nine, uh, and an American offering. Because we've just had two British films, so probably time to uh, jump the pond, as they say, and um, uh, which, of course, is all irrelevant to me. I'm an Australian, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you guys in the pond. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> you know, I live in a different world. Um, so, anyway, um, directed by um, Walter Hill, and it is The Warriors. And this is... I think a really surprising little film, actually. Um, I really liked it. And uh, it is the story of gangs in New York. And no, not the movie The Gangs of New York, but it is about, <laughs> yeah. it's about a sort of a look at, at, at gang life. Although it's meant to be a bit futuristic, isn't it? It's not meant to be. Mm-hmm. It's sort of like 100% accurate to, to 1979 New York. Um, what well, sort of is, but it isn't. It's, it's, it's sort of a bit weird. Um, and, um, <laughs> it, it, it follows the, uh, thing that the biggest gang in New York, uh, which, is, which I've forgotten what they're called. Um, I'm sure we can look it up in a second. Um, which is run by a gentleman called Cyrus. And, there you go. Um, and that's, that's the Gramercy riffs. There right. You go. Okay. And Cyrus comes up with a plan where, he wants to incorporate all the other gangs in New York to create a super gang and basically take on the police and totally control the city. Well, so all the gangs go to a meeting in New York. Uh, well, somewhere in New York. I can't remember exactly where it was in New York. You'd probably know better, Velvet. Um, um, I don't remember either. Just somewhere in New York. Somewhere central in New York, <laughs> if you like, yes. And uh, so anyway, so all the gangs gather. But during their great rally, um, Cyrus is murdered. And <gasps> yes, and the murder um, is uh well, it's blamed on a gang called the Warriors. Uh, now, of course, the Warriors didn't do it. They are actually <laughs> innocent. But, of course, now all the gangs of New York and um, the police themselves are now trying to hunt down the Warriors and all they are trying to do is to escape back to their home turf. Ah, see how I got that? Home turf? <laughs> right on. So their well home done. turf which is Coney Island. Now, I, I believe Coney Island is 
well, it's obviously must be part of New York, isn't it? The, p- pardon yeah. my ignorance here, but um, oh no, you're fine. No, but it's far away. It's, yeah, you know, so it's, 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 gonna, it's you know, it's going. You can't just walk there. You got to take the transportation system, right? Yeah, okay. There. So, so the film basically runs over a night, um, and uh, and it follows the um, uh, the escape, the run of our gang, the Warriors, as they try to avoid the police and all the other gangs uh, who are trying to hunt them down and also trying to avoid being hunted down by the gang who actually committed the murder. Um, so, uh, but, uh, and well, that's really our film. That's really our film. I can't give away the ending. Um, the ending is, is interesting. I won't say what happens, but let's just say that... Um, well, it's got an ending. I can't give it away. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give it away. But our movie basically finishes at dawn. Uh, so their run will come to an end. But I'm not going to tell you how the run comes to an end. I, I want you to actually <laughs> watch it. So now I know that you're a fan of this um, Velvet. Yes. Um, this movie asks a question when you watch it. The question is, can you dig it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, 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 I can dig it. Um, this movie is ridiculously iconic for how simple it is. It's full of one-liners that if you quote them, people are like, oh, that's the Warriors. Um, the visuals for this film are very simple yet iconic. Um, there's so much stuff going on in this movie. So first off, when you start the movie and it's introducing the whole concept of the gangs, Um, It's basically, um, it's supposed to be, like you said, it's supposed to be some kind of somewhere in the future. And I've seen the original cut of this, and I've seen the, you know, re-released director's cut, which is not much different. But if, you know, if you go for a version, go ahead and get the director's cut. It doesn't actually have any additional scenes. What they've done is it has um, these comic book storyboard inserts that are really nicely done, which that's the version you got to see, right, Warren? Yes, that's right. With the... Which, I mean, and before the movie just didn't have those. And also at the very beginning, they compare the journey of the warriors trying to get home to their home turf, as you said, to an actual Greek um, story uh, that basically some, you know, Greek troops fell behind enemy lines and they had to fend off like basically a ton of people and they were a really small group. So, Um, sorry, can I just say, is this the story of the Battle of Thermopylae? Um, I'll I'll put that into terms that people that haven't done an arts degree will understand. Um, (laughs) The 300. And it's not that one, but it's a very similar story. Uh, Okay. It's a very similar story. I'm really bad with the whole Greek mythology thing. Even though I've seen this movie a million times, I still can't remember the name of the group of (laughs) Greek warriors. It's just not a part. It's just not a part of my lexicon. I just can't get it in there for some reason. But, um, there's just so much that makes this movie stand out. So it's, first off, it's a very simple premise. I mean, it's just a gang trying to get home to their home turf. Another thing that makes this movie stand out is everybody in this movie is a bad guy. Even the the gang we're rooting for, these are fucking criminals. These oh, are yeah. Not nice, these are not nice people. I don't know to what extent the warriors actually go around killing people, but they definitely beat people up. Uh, One of the members gets arrested because he's trying to rape a woman in a park. I mean, these are not nice people. But for some reason, there's some kind of camaraderie that makes you root for these people, and you want them to get home. You want everybody to be okay. This movie's um, wrought with minor flaws. Like, (laughs) for example, they come across a woman named Mercy, and she kind of disappears for a short part in the movie, and then she kind of reappears. She comes, she keeps coming back and forward all the time, doesn't she? Yeah. And, like, in one point, like, so when they first meet her, she's wearing this pink top, and then later they come across her again, and now she's wearing a coat, and they're like, well, where'd you get the coat from? She says she stole it. It turns out she had actually broken her wrist during filming, and so she's wearing the coat to cover up the fact that she has a broken wrist in the movie now. <laughs> so oh, is movie, that yes. what happened? Yes, yes. I thought the it movie. was. I thought it was done for totally different reasons. So <laughs> no. Ah, oh, because <laughs> no. I, I had I, I had a theory about this, but obviously my theory was wrong. No, they uh, wrote it into the script because, like, she broke her wrist because there's a scene where they're running down the railroad track, her, and I believe it was Fox was the gang member. Yeah, Fox 
Fox was the gang member that witnessed um, Cyrus getting murdered, the the guy that, you know, assembled all the gangs at the beginning. So Fox um, witnesses his murder, and they're both, him and Mercy are running down the train track. So originally in this movie, those two were supposed to have a love story. But the director found that the character that plays Swan, Michael Beck, the actor that plays Swan, he and Mercy had better chemistry. So he wrote that story out, and the actor got pissed off and quit. So that's why he gets killed by falling ah. on the track. Yeah, that's why he gets killed in the movie, but it's not like really well done because it's like he's fighting with a police officer, you know, on, in the subway, and then the police officer throws him onto the track and the train comes by and kills him. That's because he quit the movie and he was gone. So they were like, fuck it. You know, <laughs> and actually in the original cut, his name was actually removed from the credit listing. It's been wow. reinstated now. But I mean, there, there's, so this movie has lots of little flaws. But um, the gangs, let's talk about the gangs. So the whole theory of this is that it's somewhere in the future where gangs outnumber police officers. So this one gang member's like, hey, if all of us gangs stop fucking fighting each other and we band together, we outnumber the fucking police and we can run New York. So, I mean, this is a huge plan. And I mean, honestly, if you look at it from a civilian standpoint, let's be glad Cyrus got murdered because that would not be a good thing. <laughs> but in the story of the movie, you're upset that Cyrus gets murdered because you're like, oh, man, he was trying to unite these gangs for for at the, for a moment. You think a good thing, but then you really start thinking about the repercussions. But so the gangs outnumber the cops. So but at the same time, cops and gangs are still quite the enemies. And then this movie Cops instantly know who's in a gang because the gangs in this movie are, have very distinct personalities. It's not like today where, you know, it could be a random group of people and you wouldn't even know they were in a gang until they tell you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Well, what's, what's, then, what, what's it called? They're colors, isn't it? I mean, because all yes. gangs have colors, yes. which is, which really yes. just re- refers to a uniform or a badge or, a, or, 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 or some such thing. But yeah, you're quite right in this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll, no, I'll let you finish, and then I'll... I'll <laughs> oh, I could go on forever, so interject any time. Um, but I, I, this is one of those movies I love to death, but I cannot remember how or when I saw this movie for the first time and how it became such a part of, like... It's definitely in my top ten. Like, if I ever have to make a top ten list of movies I love of all time, this would probably be, like, number ten. This would be on the list. Um, just because it has just <laughs> when the movie starts and they start showing you the gangs, it's funny, but interesting at the same time. Cause I mean, like you got like the Harlem style gangsta pimps, you know, like they got like black hats and they got purple vests. There's a group of mimes. I they're know. Evidently, oh my God. They're evidently a gang. There's um, an Asian group. That's like a gang, but they're dressed kind of like peasants. There's um, the one they call the punks and their leader rolls around on, on, roller skates which sounds stupid as hell today but when you see it in the movie the imagery is really like daunting like oh this guy's going to chase you down on his roller skates <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean if he, he could just give you one kick to the head with those and you'd be dead you know seriously um uh, oh my god the orphans they were horrible looking i mean they literally looked like orphans like abandoned children they were dirty they were disgusting they were just oh they were so gross looking it just goes on and on and on and on and there was a mixture in this movie there were actual gang members uh the the studio production had to actually pay gangs to (laughs) for protection as they call they were paying this one gang five hundred dollars a day for protection to keep the other gangs off of them while they were filming it um and Another gang, when they saw the Warriors' colors, because they're wearing fake leather vests. That was fake leather, by the way. But there was one gang that was kind of like, these motherfuckers are wearing our colors. They had to pay that gang to be in the movie so that they wouldn't beat up the fucking actors. And they always made sure the actors never left the set wearing any of the like vests so they wouldn't get beat up off the set. Um, they had to film at night because the movie takes place at night. So they would film from midnight to 8 a.m. every day. And they filmed for two months. <laughs> it's just <laughs> there, were, there were times when they were too loud while they were filming and people on neighboring buildings would urinate off the top of the building and piss on the crew. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. One gang member came through and like broke a bunch of equipment. So that's when they started paying the other gang for protection. I, it just... <laughs> 
so this film was wrought with problems. They originally, uh, the director, Walter Hill, originally wanted the Warriors to actually be an all-black or a Latino gang, and the producers were like, no way, we've got to have white people in this movie. It cannot be all-black or all-Hispanic, because they thought it would just hurt the marketability of the movie. But just, ah. Oh. I just I love it. Well, it's, it's simple. Yeah, it's simple, but it's exciting. And just you never know what's coming next the first time you see it because you're like, oh, shit, like they're trying to get out of this territory. So part of the thing was they have this huge meeting uh, in um, in New York and it's nine de- delegates from every gang. It's over 100 gangs have shown up with nine de- delegates. And part of it was, OK, we're doing a truce. Nobody bring any weapons. So this is not your typical gang movie. This is not a gang movie where every single person's running around with guns shooting each other. So they're using like metal pipes. Some of them have knives or sometimes it's just bare fisted. There's very few people in this movie that have guns. So you're just kind of like, oh, what's going to happen? And then you see there's so many gangs and certain gangs are in certain territories and they're going to have to cross through certain territories. And that gang catches them. They're going to get their ass, especially now that they think that the warriors are the one who killed Cyrus, although they didn't do it, but they got blamed for it. So what I found fascinating, though, is the depiction of the gangs, because it's like we got this so much through Hollywood through. um, I mean, this is what 1979. So especially through the 80s, where gangs, uh, whether it be serious movies or comedies quite often as well. The gangs are just portrayed so unrealistically, you know, like the way they dress, um, you know, and, and all this sort of stuff. And this movie does obviously have that in it as well, because the gangs are just dressed ludicrously. I mean, no gangs would seriously <laughs> dress like this, right? Uh, but, um, you know, but then again, that's what sort of makes it, because the whole yeah. idea is, like like you said, you've got a gang of French mimes who are all done up like <laughs> Marcel Marceau. I mean, you know, it, it is absolutely, it, 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 that, it is sort of the fun of it, you know, that, that is definitely yeah. the fun of it. I mean, this is not a gang movie, let's say something like Rumblefish, okay, which no. is, uh, you know, a, a, a trying to make a real realistic look, you know, at what gang, although obviously that movie is set in the 1950s, but um, mm-hmm. but a look at what, you know, real gang life is actually like. So, um, you know, this is t- to a degree tongue-in-cheek. Would that be fair or...? Um, um, it, I mean, it's, they wanted this movie to be a lot grittier. It's actually based on a book by Sol Urich, and oh, my God, the book is horrific. I will never read it because I was like, oh, you know what? I love this movie so much. I want to read the book. And then I heard, like, a couple of reviews about it and some excerpts from it, and I was like, never mind because... <laughs> um, There's stuff in there like, um, you know, the scene in the movie. So the Warriors are, you know, the very first gang the Warriors come across when they're trying to get home to Coney Island. Because at first they're just like, okay, we're going to get on the fucking, you know, subway, go home, we're home free. So when they get to the fucking subway, there's there's a fucking gang staked out there. There's the Turnbull, excuse me, Turnbull ACs, which that that always cracks me up because it's a group of skinheads, but they're ethnically diverse. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's, it's like the idea of you've got you've got black, Asian, and Hispanic skinheads. I mean, it is it is kind of weird, isn't it? Um, that always made me laugh. When I know. I, that. I, I know. It's, it's, yeah ethnically diverse skinheads but anyways so they manage to you know make it past the turnbull acs and they get on the subway but then they have to fucking get off because somebody set a fire and it fucking you know they have to get off the fucking subway so now they they're on foot until they get to the next station and also remember they're lost this is not their turf these are this is a kind of gang they never leave coney island so they don't know where the fuck they are they are lost and so they have so they run into this next gang Gang. And it turns out this gang is so low on the totem pole, they didn't even know about the fucking meeting in New York. Like, they weren't invited. They didn't even know about it. So they're kind of getting pissed off because they're like, what do you mean there was a meeting? Like, they, there couldn't have been a meeting if we weren't there. You know, we're the orphans. We're, we're hard. You know, we're heavy. We're bad. I know. I know. And, and so at first they're just kind of like, hey, you know. We're, you know, we come in peace. We just, you know, we we were on the subway, but, you know, it broke down and we have to walk through. And so first they're just calling, okay, you know, that's cool. So first you're just kind of like, okay, they made it past one gang, but 
you just it, stuff just keeps coming up where they have to keep going on foot and even when they do get on the subway it's there's fucking cops there so they can't take the subway so they have to run down the tracks and it just it's so simple but it keeps you so engaged and you never know what gang they're going to fight next and when they do fight gangs i think it always delivers because you know like some people complain that there's not enough fighting in this movie. They're not running into enough gangs. But I'm like, wait, hold on. Gangs are territorial, man. Any area they go into, there's going to be one gang. It's not going to be 20, 50, 30 different gangs in one area because everybody's got their fucking territory. So you just don't know whose territory they're going to walk into. And then some people complain, oh, well, where are the fucking guns? And I'm like, hello, nobody is armed right fucking now. Like, in fact, everybody who's, you know, out and about, either they're trying to get home and avoid, like, really the same story is happening to all the gangs that are trying to get home right now, to be honest. You know, they're all struggling because they're all trying to get home. Like, you know, the ones that aren't looking for the warriors, they're just trying to get home, too, and they're dealing with the same shit. Oh, fuck, we don't have any weapons on us because of the truce, and now we're going to have to walk through this fucking area. <laughs> and we don't know what gang's in this area because we don't live in this area and we're lost. So, I mean, like, there's... I think this movie delivers so well. Um, some people do complain the ending is a little anticlimactic, but I think it actually suits the simplicity of this movie. Oh, I agree. When they, yeah, when they need to fight, they fight. But it's kind of less is more is the approach. Um, They really do a good job of giving you not really character depth, but they give you enough to know whether you like the characters in the gangs or not. Like my favorite character in this is James Remar. He plays Ajax. He has the best lines in this movie. (laughs) He's the one that says he's the one that says to the guy, I'm going to take that baseball bat and shove it so far up your ass you'll turn into a popsicle. Cool, yeah. (laughs) I know, I know. Oh, dear. So, I mean, so what, so was this your first time seeing this movie, Warren? Yeah, it was. I mean, I, like most people, I think, had heard of the movie uh, because it's been around for a very long time. And everyone would, you know, quote the Warriors or mention the Warriors. And I just never got around to seeing it. (laughs) <laughs> was actually the truth, um, and and so I was really quite excited when you when you suggested it, and I thought, oh well, here you go, here's, here's finally my chance to watch this thing, you know, um, and uh, I, I have to admit, when it's it, it starts and it starts a little bit slow, but then you know once once they're actually on their their run, um, it, it's it's it, it really gets good. I mean, this movie in a sense is like so many other movies that's been made before. I mean, like, mm-hmm. for instance, you could compare it to Logan's Run, you know? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it, it, it's it's those movies where uh, some people, either a person or a group of people, are in a situation and they need to get from point A to point B, but they've got all these challenges to get through before they can get to their final destination. So that style of movie has been made, you know, forever. We still make movies like that. But this one was just it was different you know it was like it was it was making a mess sending a message making a point but it was still very watchable you know um mm-hmm. the uh, uh, the other thing too that i loved about this is because it's all set at night and um mm-hmm. and that's the sound everybody's shoes make now mm. now for me i thought that this was really really important because Normally they'd just be running around and you, you, you just sound like people running. But in this one, it's it's that clippity clop, you know, of their mm-hmm. shoes all the time. And the thing is, I, I don't know if just if yourself, Velvet, or anyone listening, think about when you were younger. In my point, or if you are younger, think about right now when you used to go out places. It was three in the morning. You were out at you know somewhere. It's the middle of the night. There's nobody around, but you're walking down the street. You know that sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. Everybody sounds twenty times louder than they actually are. You yes. know, and and this movie captured that so well. You know, the fact that this was meant to be three a.m. and when they're walking through the station, you hear that clack 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 of shoes. You know, it was. I just thought that was so well done. Whoever thought of doing that, um, it was brilliant. You know, that worked, you know, that really did work well. But the other thing, too, is you were talking about, you know, the jacket um, mm-hmm. that, that the, the, the female star wears. And um, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I actually, I actually originally thought it had been used for a different purpose, because one thing that you will notice when you watch this film is that all her early scenes, she's wearing a pink singlet. And <laughs> shall we just say the pink singlet is one hundred percent see through, and she's not wearing a bra. <laughs> Okay, is what I should say. And I actually wondered that they got to a point where they sort of thought, we're just showing a bit too much skin here. Let's throw the shirt on her for the rest of the movie, you know. Um, I, that, that was actually what I thought, you know, because every scene she's in for half the movie, you know, basically – Nothing is left to the imagination, you know. So, so I actually thought that's what it was about. So it was interesting you talk about. No, she actually broke her wrist. Um, no, they, they, so, were, yeah. they were quite comfortable having her running around in her shirt, where you can see her nipples poking through the entire time. I mean, pretty much. I think all the women in this movie. I don't think anybody was wearing a bra. I think that was just the style of that well, nineteen seventy. <laughs> well, it's also nineteen seventy nine. Um, exactly. I mean, remember that the seventies were not the decade of the bra. Um, no. You know, put, put, it, put it that way. You know, so. Um, but uh, but the other thing I did like is that one of the gangs that they run into is an all female gang. And I thought mm-hmm. that was actually quite clever, you know. I love I, that they put that in there yeah. because um, the first time I saw that movie, I was surprised to realize they were a gang. I thought it was just, you know, a group of girls that were just partying, and that's what they want you to think. And that's what even the guys think. They're so, you know, they're so macho, and it's such a heterocentric culture that they don't even think that, oh, you know, these girls could be a gang. <laughs> I know it's it's uh, but I thought that was I thought that was actually really well done and and I like the way too that they were never always together the gang often got split up divided refined each other you know and I yes. thought that was good too because it, it meant that you could run multiple scenarios and stories rather than just being one story because I loved it in the edit that we're talking about with the comic book um, edit where. It each scene, not each scene, but each story, um, if you like, starts with um, a, a drawn comic book and then it fades into the real movie. And then when that finishes, it fades back into the comic book. And you actually get like yeah. the, the writing, you know, oh, and meanwhile at the station and then it crosses back. So mm-hmm. um, I thought that was yeah, really, like that. it was really well done. And, but also by splitting the gang up in that way, it, we could have more than mm-hmm. one story going, you know, they could have more adventures than they would have necessarily have had if they had have all been together all the time. So I thought that was that was good. But you were 100% right about, I mean, these are total anti-heroes. I mean, oh God, oh God. Big time. we may be rooting for them, but these are bad guys. I mean, these guys' life is based on crime. I mean, when they first meet um, the female star, their first reaction is they threaten to gang rape her. I mean, you know, it is, um, you know, these are not nice guys, you know, by, by no. any stretch of the matter. Um, but, uh, but, but we sympathize with them. We, we want mm-hmm. to be with them. It, it's a bit like uh, another famous movie, not so much about gangs, but uh, a movie that was written about skinheads. Um, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the neo Nazi movement, um, which is called Romper Stomper, which was one of, um, uh, uh, Russell Crowe's um, very early movies. And um, mm-hmm. that's another interesting movie where we see the same thing. These are evil bastards. These are fascists. These are neo-Nazi skinheads. They mm-hmm. live for beating up people, for killing people because they're, you know, they're, they're racially different, you know, and so forth. But they're anti-heroes and we bond with them throughout the movie. Even though they're the most disgusting people on earth, we bond with them. You know, and mm-hmm. and I think this movie it definitely achieves that. Where you know we bond with the warriors, we feel for the warriors, yeah. we feel almost like yeah. we're part of the warriors. You know, uh, so yeah. it's 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 it it definitely pulls that off. Definitely pulls that off. Yeah, definitely. Um, what did you think of the soundtrack? Did you like the music? Mm. Oh, he says as he sips his drink. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that so fast. Um, it's uh, uh, The soundtrack is great. This is actually, it's interesting how each one of our movies has not, it was never planned, but how they seem to link into each other. Um, for instance, um, we, we're talking before about um, uh, Absolute Beginners and the soundtrack of this, of how it was the soundtrack of the 80s. This movie mm-hmm. is very much the soundtrack of that 
join between the 70s and the 80s. You know, we mm-hmm. have it is. Yeah, it's like we we've moved out of that sort of 70s sound, you know, the big, you know, um, sort of pop rock, you know, the you, you know all that sort of stuff um and and we're moving into that more pop sound of the 80s and it's really interesting how this music is just it it that's exactly what it is. It's a time capsule and it's it's mm-hmm. wonderful. And and the way they yeah the way they fold it into the um into the movie as well is really well done. Yes, um, yeah, yes, it's yes, uh, I totally agree. brilliant. Yeah, it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, the entire score, except for uh, depending on what version of the movie you watch, because there's the director's cut and the uh, new release cut, and I believe on the new release cut they changed the song because um, the original cut. Um, it has an entire score of synthesized rock and roll music. So all the songs you hear are synthesized. That's synthesized rock and roll. It's not, you know, an actual band playing, which is pretty interesting. And then um, in the original cut, I believe it's a song by, um, oh, darn it, Walsh. Walsh is singing a song, and in the newer version, I believe they re- uh, replaced it with one of the synthesized rock and roll songs. But I also, like you said, I like how, like, it has the DJ, which is very iconic, the yes. DJ is like on this radio station and she's kind of like using code words and saying, hey, boppers look good out there. And, you know, she's telling them, hey, there's this gang that you should be keeping your eyes out for. They might be walking through your territory. If you see them, get them. And, you know, and then she always plays a song that relates to the story, like, you better run. <laughs> and then it like folds into the next scene of the story with the song playing and it fades into the background, but it's still part of the scene. And, yeah, I like how the, the, the DJ and this music does connect each each, each cons, uh, consecutive scene of the movie. And let's see what else we got. There's so much going on in this. I, 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 what, what, oh, what, oh, 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 yeah. The fights. What did you think of the fights? I, I, thought, <laughs> I thought the fights were actually well done because they're violent without being too violent. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there, there's definitely violence, you know, uh, but it's not it's not like violence the way we portray it today. You know, this is, mm-hmm. um, you know, it, they, they hold back on the blood, um, you know, it's it, it, people get knocked down, they stay down. Um, it's it, it is very much tamed back, but I think in a way that's maybe good because it opens the movie up to a larger audience. Absolutely, the, I actually love the fighting in this movie. Everything was shot on location in New York. The only time they actually used a sound stage was for the bathroom fight with the punks. That was the leader on the roller skates. Ah, uh, yep. That actually. That was actually a choreographed fight that took them five days to shoot from midnight to 8 a.m. every day for five days to shoot that. And I just, oh, I love that scene where they're just kind of like, they're hiding in the bathroom in the stalls, you know, they're in there. The punks know they're in there. And the guy comes rolling in on his roller skates and they think for some reason reason that they're going to surprise the warriors i mean everybody knows they're in there I know. <laughs> but, the fight, I know. but the fight that breaks out i just i love it okay this seems to be everybody's favorite fight scene or at least favorite gang in this movie the baseball furies those are some oh, scary my looking God. i know oh those are some scary looking dudes i mean seriously that's, that's some scary shit if you're walking down the street and you see some guy in full-on baseball gear but then he's got like kiss face paint like kiss the rock and roll band face paint and he's just standing there swinging a bat i'm going to be a little nervous because that dude looks a little crazy (laughs) well you know you know what do you know what that reminded me of a lot and that is clockwork orange oh oh good reference good reference yeah um the baseball furies the baseball furies are actually because the director uh walter hill loves baseball and he loves the band kiss so he actually created the baseball ah, Furies. So that's how they came ba- about. Based, yeah, based on that concept. Um, those actually um, were – those were not an actual gang. Those were actually, um, you know, stunt doubles or not stunt doubles. Stunt I, I kind of assumed that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I kind so of assumed that. People don't have to worry. Yeah, people don't have to worry about walking into baseball fury territory. But, yeah, um, they, but the way they introduce them, though, is so scary because they're just, like, run, like, running really fast, and they're not running out of breath. They're not sweating. They're all carrying a baseball bat, which you know you don't want to get hit with a fucking baseball bat because that's going to kill you. <laughs> yes. But the Warriors are badasses, and they dispatch them pretty quickly. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, they they do. They do. They're they're definitely a tough gang, and they definitely 
Uh, no, I'm not going to give away the ending, but I'm going to say they prove themselves. Um, you know, in, in yeah. the end, I mean, they they definitely prove themselves, and uh, it's uh, no, no. I, I'm I'm really glad I finally got to see this Velvet. Actually, I mean, it's um, you know, this is definitely a cult classic, without any doubt. Yes. You know, a, at all, this is a cult classic. This is a movie that people reference all the time, and that's a dead giveaway. If people are going to reference a movie, um, mm-hmm. you know, then it's fallen into the realms of Cult. So uh, you know this is is there without without any doubt. Um, it's uh, yeah. I, 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 Rockstar I, I, Games. You know. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, 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 no. no <laughs> Rockstar I'm done. Rockstar Games. Okay. Rockstar Games actually made a video game, a shoot for shoot re- reshoot of this movie as a video game in 2005. That's highly revered. So I mean that already there gives it cult status when they actually because they've done that with Scarface. They've made you know like basically any of the scenes you see in the movie they've made in video game format. And then you have little missions that you complete. When you complete the mission, it'll be the next scene from the movie. So I mean they've done that with Scarface and they've done it with the Warriors, which is really cool. And it's interesting that. They they did the Warriors because that shows you how much of a cult classic it is. And honestly, um, when they were first financing the game to make the game, a lot of people did, had never heard of the Warriors. And a lot of companies and, you know, their backers were kind of like, well, we don't know if we want to put money towards this project because we're not sure many people have heard of this movie but this really breathed you know breathed new life into this film and like helped restore its cult status for people who had not heard of the warriors never seen it because they first came across this video game and they're like oh this is actually a movie i gotta see this but um there's some uh, i gotta point out my favorite actor in here again james remar if yeah. you're a fan of dexter if you're a fan of dexter james remar played dexter's dad you know his police officer dad yep um James Remar has also dubiously played Raiden on Mortal Kombat Annihilation. <laughs> horrible <laughs> movie. Hor- horrible movie, but, but I love James Remar. I've seen him in so many things. He's been in so many things. He's still a working actor. And this is like one of his first acting roles. And he is so young in it. And he's so, he's such an asshole. He's a terrible person in this movie, but he has the best lines in the movie. And just, I love that little diastema he has. And if I'm using fancy vocabulary, diastema, the gap between his teeth, I think that's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> And seeing him so young in this movie, it's like twenty two. <laughs> it's uh, it is yeah. it's amazing that, that that when that happens, isn't it? When you, um, mm-hmm. especially for like for me, if I ever discover, it, because it's different if you've grown up with the movie, uh, because mm-hmm. you remember the actor, you know, from way back. You've grown, <laughs> but when you see a movie for the first time, which is older, and then and mm-hmm. when you look at it, and you sort of go. Oh wow, that's so and so. Oh wow, that's so and so. You know, um, yes, yeah, that, yes. that's always that's you know always very cool. I, I, I think so. Uh, yeah, no, it's um, uh, no, no. I'm I'm really glad I got to see this one finally. I should say, um, <laughs> I'm really glad I finally got to see this one. So. Uh, it's definitely got thumbs up from me. There's no doubt about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a very simple plot line, total anti-heroes. I think that's what's part of the allure. Um, I love that it's gangs that don't have guns, so they have to be a little bit more creative. And it's – oh, I almost forgot. We have to talk about the fucking subway scene. Okay, so we have Swan and Mercy. They, You know, Swan and Mercy. So Swan is one of the Warrior Gang members, and then Mercy is the woman that's kind of helping them show the way. She knows they're lost, and she's like, hey, I know my way around the subway. I'll show you the alternatives since you can't take the one you usually take. So they've gotten separated from the rest of the gang. So it's Swan and Mercy sitting in this one subway just to get to the next stop. They're hoping to find the rest of the gang when they get there. And it stops. And two couples get in that are oh, on the yes. subway home, on the subway home, home from their prom. Um, did did that scene resonate with you? Did it like did that have a message for you? What'd you get out of that? Um, I mean, I, I I found it interesting. It's like what was interesting. I thought is that they really didn't notice the gang when they hop on the train. Like they're they're quite oblivious mm-hmm. to them. And then when they sit down. Mm-hmm. They both of them notice each other and they, they look at them. And I almost sort of, I mean, obviously you can see with the two, the two couples from the prom, they're starting to feel mm-hmm. very uncomfortable. Like what mm-hmm. is, is going to happen here? You know, and they suddenly go all straight and they stop talking and, um, you know, and they stop laughing. And, but the, our, our female lead who's, oh God, who's mercy, Harry, mercy. <laughs> 
you Mercy. look at her, you look at her, and um, it's almost like she's sort of dreaming of what they've got. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's like like you can see her. She's almost embarrassed. She starts to mm-hmm. straighten her hair, fits her hair. Um, you know, it, it's like. You know, I, I, I'm not good enough. I, I, I need mm-hmm. to be better. And, um, you know, and then suddenly, you know, she sort of closes her eyes. And when she opens mm-hmm. her eyes again, you know, they're gone. And it's like, mm-hmm. it's almost like a scene. It's like, I, I've been rejected by society. I, I'm not part of the world, you know, anymore. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm like this, yeah, you know, here I am now. I'm almost now become part of a gang. I virtually am now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not. I'm not part of that world anymore. I, I've lost my innocence, mm-hmm. sort of thing. I don't know. Mm-hmm. That's just how I saw it. No, you got a lot of. No, there's a lot going on in that scene. There's a lot of really fascinating interpretations I've heard, and it, it's amazing that they pull that off with no dialogue. First off, yes. I mean, you really what you get out of it is what you get out of it. There's no dialogue, so it could just be. It could just be, you know, six people riding the fucking subway and that could be it. But, no, I agree. There's definitely something going on there. Uh, first off, it's definitely a case of the haves and haves not have nots. So while they're, you know, struggling to just stay alive and get home, you have other people that were just at prom. <laughs> and yes. they're going to be partying and they're just going to go home and, you know, go back to school the next day. I mean, they're just, you know, having a normal mainstream life. Um, also, when she goes to fix her hair, Swan, you know, grabs her hand and takes it. Down. he's saying do it for yourself you know if you want to do anything for yourself do it for yourself don't do it to impress them they don't matter also when they get off when I, when the two couples from the prom get off the train it's because they realize they're on the wrong train you know that they're somewhere they don't need to be because they're going to get involved in something that they don't know about and that they're not ready to deal with i mean there's so much going on in that scene it's amazing uh social commentary of that these gangs are also, um, you know, Swan and Mercy. We don't know Swan's story, and we don't know all of Mercy's story. But long story short, they are the non. Um, they're alternative lifestyles. For whatever reason, they didn't have the opportunities to go to school and go to prom. For some reason, you know, Mercy you know, has to work as a prostitute. For whatever reason, Swan has to be in a gang to, you know, have a family and have, you know, I guess money and food and shelter. I mean, these are these are alternative lifestyles. And just, it's just, I love that scene. It's really well done, really s- simple. And it's just <laughs> no dialogue. And it delivers this message that there's yeah. always the haves and have nots, you know, there's always the haves and have nots. But I think it's also that, um, I mean, it's not only, I think when he sort of, with his hand gesture is saying, um, you know, do it for yourself. To me, I also felt he was sort of saying that world's dead to you now. You're now part mm. of us. Um, mm. you, you can't connect to that world anymore. And it was mm-hmm. it was almost like her last hurrah of normality before mm-hmm. she fell into game life. Um, mm, that's you know, a good one. Yeah, because so, also what happens? She sees her dreams. She closes her eyes. They're gone. When and her dreams her are eyes, gone. Dreams gone. Yeah. Exactly. Well and, done. Yeah, <laughs> and, and, and I, I, well. I definitely saw that. Yeah, definitely. You know, I definitely um, saw that. Yeah. Did you like the humor in this movie? Because the movie's rife with humor, offensive language, humor. Did you like oh, that? Oh, yeah, yeah. It, 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 is, it, it is good. You know, it is good. It's, it's, it's got its funny bits, um, but it's got its very serious bits. It's got its very threatening bits. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's the full package, you know, you would say. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. definitely well, well done. I have to take my you know, head off to, what is it, um, uh, Walter Hill, Walter the, Hill. Dire- the director. Yeah. Um, you know, he did a really, really good job. Uh, and uh, But it was fascinating, you know, you saying, you know, talking about um, how real life sort of crosses over with filmmaking, oh, you know, with the God. use yeah. of the gangs. Yeah. Because there, yeah. there, was, there was another very famous movie. Um, it's not the same by any means, but a movie called Stone, which is about a bikey gang, about a police officer that has to go undercover in a bikey gang. I think I've seen that a long time ago. Yeah. I think I know exactly what you're talking about. And, and the interesting thing is that with that is that they used a real bikey gang to play the bikey gang. Oh, and, I didn't and, know that. And so a number of the fight scenes that you actually see in the movie, that's not staged. 
They're oh really going for it. They're actually re- – when you see somebody oh. hit in the face with a, a baseball bat or a cricket bat or a – so, oh. this, this is really happening. This is oh not staged. God. Yeah. Um, and because it was uh, – uh, apparently I've um, – the, the, <laughs> They they say that the um, uh, a number of the actors I know I, I've seen um, uh, Rebecca Gibney was I th- no not Rebecca Gibney I've forgotten but anyway um, but I have heard um, a couple of the actors actually say that they felt lucky to have survived the film like many oh, of them God. thought that they were actually going to die during the you know the oh, making of this oh, film oh God uh, that's so, scary yeah so cool. uh, so it was very interesting you talk about the fact that you know. The real gangs of New York actually had a part in this in this movie, so that's <laughs> yeah. you know very yeah. interesting, very very yeah, interesting. Because this movie wouldn't have gotten made if they hadn't let the gangs in. Like some of them were just kind of like, hey, if we let them be extras in the movie, they'll keep it cool. Then some of them they had to fucking pay to be in the movie, and then they had to straight up pay one gang for fucking protection. <laughs> yes, just, my, amazing. I'm like, oh my god. Um, there's one scene in this movie that makes me laugh um, when they're dealing with the orphans and the. Or- Orphans get pissed off and decide that, you know, we need to come down on this gang. We can't just let them walk through our territory. And the warriors throw a Molotov cocktail at the car and it blows up. Yes. <laughs> that always makes me laugh for some reason. I'm just like, really? Oh, it was, one it... serious question that I have to ask you before we wrap this yep. up. Okay. For my viewers, excuse me, listeners that don't know, um, Warren collects model trains. And I was wondering if a warrior, a warrior style commuter train would be a possible addition to your collection um well it's interesting you say that um i have been to a number of uh railway exhibitions yeah that shows you how sad i am i actually go to model railway exhibitions (laughs) um (laughs) there's two big ones that they hold every year that i go to and um i have actually seen people modeling the new york subway uh, so it would be oh. fascinating to actually see um, with uh, it, it's really interesting the way they do it because it's all underground, but it's all done behind perspex. So you can actually see the. Oh, uh, cool. it's, so instead of being trains on top, like which is normal, it's actually uh-huh. all under, uh-huh. which is really, really well. So I am sure somebody oh, somewhere really cool. yeah, could have done it. it. It wouldn't surprise me, you know. Uh, really wouldn't surprise me at all if there's somebody who has model, modeled the New York um, uh, sort of subway system. If there's a little scene somewhere at a station where you'd see some little warrior figures, it wouldn't surprise me one bit because um, <laughs> model railway builders, you know, like myself, um, mm-hmm. we love to do little scenes all over the place, you know, um, uh-huh. which we're, we're, we're notorious for it. We, we get off on it actually, you know, so, um, <laughs> you know, like we do little scenes like, um, you know, there might be a graveyard and there's a funeral. There might be, I, I know one guy who has a model railway set and he's got a shotgun wedding with the father actually holding the shotgun, you know, <laughs> to the thing, you know, so, uh, a, a guy who models American railways. Um, so, uh, cool. you know, yeah, it, there's all sorts of things like that. On mine, I have a certain style of movie which has been shot in the forest. Uh, it's hidden away, and you can actually see it. I won't say what it is, but um, so all all um, um, all uh, all modelers do this sort of stuff. So, gee, I'm getting off the point, but. Um, um, so I wouldn't surprise me if someone's done it, Velvet. It really wouldn't surprise me. There you me. go. So, yeah, we can get you a little commuter train and we'll just put, you know, we'll spray paint a W on it, spray paint a red W for Warriors and have it all like, um, oh, my God, like the Turnbull AC's fucking bus that are driving. That thing's so graffitied to death. Oh, my God. Yeah. And then the Rogues, when they have that uh, old uh, 50s style car and it's all graffitied to death. So we can get you a little Warrior style commuter train to add to your collection. Oh, cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I did it again. I did it again. It doesn't bother stop me. Doing it. I've got to stop doing it. Um, all right. Well, me. <laughs> we should, because uh, we have run so much over two hours. This is the longest <laughs> podcast we have ever done. Um, obviously, we really got into these movies. So um, um, we yeah. really probably should wrap it up. So um, Right on. Wh- so how are you going to score this? And I know it's going to be high. Yeah, definitely high. It's not a perfect film, but it is so... I love this movie. Um, It's to the point now, like, before when I would watch it, I was just like, 
you know, really into it. But now it's like, I love this movie so much. I just get giddy. Like I'm already anticipating what's coming up and what they're going to say and what's going to happen. So it's just like, now for me, it's just like pure nostalgia watching this film. It's just pure entertainment. I love it. I love hearing all the trivia because there is so much trivia on like how hard it was to make this film and dealing with the real life gangs. So definitely going to rate it high. If you've not checked it out, if you're this is probably something you haven't seen before, and it's worth seeing one time. Again, keep in mind, it is not a perfect movie, and again, it is not um, – it's um, it's a simple story, <laughs> a really simple story, just a gang trying to get home. That's really all it is, um, but it's fun. So I'm going to give this 4.5 Eric's out of a possible 5 Eric's. Oh, that's excellent. That is excellent. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I'm I'm – going to be close. I'm going to give it four Eric's out of five uh, because nice. I I really did like it. I actually enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would, is the truth. Um, the first 10 minutes, I sort of thought, I'm not going to like this. I really thought, I'm not going to like this. <laughs> um, but once they start there, pretty much all the way up until the, um, uh, the shooting of Cyrus, I sort of thought, oh, I'm going to hate this. Uh, this is not <laughs> bonding with me. It's really not... But once they started their run, that's when I really – that's when I said, no, now I get it. I like this movie <laughs> because I, lo- I love those run movies, you know. Like, like I'm a Yay. huge fan of Logan's Run, one of my favourite films. I think it's great. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, this is – no, and, and so once I realised where this movie was going, I was hooked, absolutely hooked. Awesome. Um, awesome. So, yeah, so I'm going to give it some – uh, most definitely, I'll give it four out of five Eric's. Excellent. So that's basically a wrap. So I think we had some pretty cool films. Yeah, definitely. It was an interesting mix tonight. It was. And uh, apologies to anyone if this show has gone a little bit longer than it normally does. You know, just my pause God, and it has. save for later. Yeah, yeah, exactly just right. pause us and save us for later. <laughs> that's the beauty. That's the beauty of podcasts. So um, yes. if you can't listen to it all in one go, do it in a couple of goes. That's not a problem. Um, exactly. So I suppose um, shout outs as always. So who's going to do it? Okay. Okay. You want to try it? <laughs> no, I'll get it wrong. You do it. You always do it better. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. <laughs> I always get it okay. wrong. <laughs> it's all good. Go ahead and follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Cult Movie Show. If you want to follow me, Velvet, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at OMG, it's Velvet. But please be 18 years or older because I do post adult content. And as I've said before many times, if you're into model trains, you can follow my co host, Martini Super Dry, on Twitter. And who else? Do we need to shout anybody else out besides ourselves? Alana um, Evans, she supplies she su- music at she the end su- of the show. She supplies the music at the end of the show, but she won't be this podcast. Um, I'll get oh, to that. But I'll get okay. to that. I'll get to that in a minute once we've finished every all the shout outs. Um, I was just going to say, remember too, we are on YouTube, which is uh, the oh. Cult Movie Show on YouTube. Right. Um, so if you would rather YouTube rather than iTunes, I know some Windows based people prefer YouTube because they don't want iTunes on their machines. Uh, so mm-hmm. you can choose uh, YouTube instead. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, we are on Facebook as well, which is the cult movie show, but you won't really find anything on there other than posts and links to the show. That's it. Right. There'll be no okay. other information. If there's any particular movies you'd like us to review, if you have a short film that you'd like to submit for us to review, Feel free to tweet us, private message us on Twitter, or you can even email us at um, cultmovieshow at gmail.com. And, yeah, I think that's it. That's it. That's it. So that's a wrap. So that was a podcast 29. Uh, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed. And uh, normally at this time, Velvet, we would say that uh, we're going to leave you with Alana Evans and Perfect. We will, of course, next week be doing that. But this week we're going to leave you with a little track which is Velvet and my tribute to the people of Melbourne for something that happened which was horrendous and horrific. And we just want to say, stay strong, Melbourne. I'm a Melbourne boy at heart, and we just want to stay, stay strong. The sun reshines in the morning. So uh, we're just going to leave you with a little tribute to Melbourne. So uh, that's it. Well said. Well done. 
So I will, Good stuff. I will talk to you again, of course, next week, Velvet. Okay. Yes, definitely. And of we'll course. be back with uh, oh, Podcast oh, oh, 30. Oh, I almost forgot. I almost yeah, forgot. Yeah. So um, oh, let's say it really quick. Uh, next week is our Australian movie uh, special, isn't it? Yes, it is, because Australia Day, uh, of course, will be next week. Now, the show, of course, won't actually be on Australia Day. It'll be a couple of days <laughs> later. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but we will be doing a couple of Australiana films. So if you're I'm into so some Australian cinema, um, we will be doing totally Australian films. So, uh, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so there you go. That's just in honour of my national day, Australia Day. So, nice. uh, so that should be fun. That should be fun. Yeah, and hopefully, fun. <laughs> hopefully too for um, you know American, Canadian, British listeners, uh, German listeners, Dutch. I'll try to think of all the countries. We've got Singapore, Malaysia, <laughs> uh, uh, oh God, um, China. I don't know how the hell that happened. Um, <laughs> um, uh, uh, the, uh, because I thought iTunes was illegal in China. So obviously oh. I'm, I, I'm, I'm incorrect on that. Either that or there's lots of people using VPN. Um, we've mm-hmm. got South Africa, I think I mentioned Canada, Argentina, Brazil, wow. uh, Hong Kong. Um, uh, where else? Uh, oh, 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 sorry, Poland. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and there's a whole heap that I'm, I, I'm missing out. So, uh, um, so if you're from those countries, you may not have seen a lot of Australian films. So we thought that we might put two up. So um, that is a wrap. Excellent. See you guys next week. See you uh, next week, and uh, we will leave you with our little uh, tribute to uh, the city on the bay that has four seasons in one day, Melbourne. (laughs) Stay strong, guys. Stay strong. Kids, I've been away From this great city by the bay I had a ball, I missed you all Could always hear a sweet Melbourne call I've known true wealth I have made love to life itself Melbourne, I have done it all for you This is my town My never say goodbye town So happy I could cry town You're looking at a guy Who knows Cause I The shining cities of the world I've climbed the peaks I've sailed the seas I've loved the girls I've stared dead smack in the face I have won each and every race But I never knew how much you needed me This is my town I swear that I could fly town I never say goodbye town You're looking at a guy who knows From Hollywood to Old Bombay From Rome to Zanzibar Tell me that you're cold and gray No place for a star